Welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 12th edition of the Temporal Web Analytics Workshop. Uh, my name is Mark Spanier and I'm one of the co-chairs of this event together with um, Ricardo Baezayetz and um, Omar Alonso, who will both join later on. Uh, as you know, they are living in California and have a big time difference for the moment being. Unfortunately, we are still not yet able to meet in public uh, or in, 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 in presence, so we will have to do it virtually again. But hopefully the next year things will change. Uh, nevertheless, we have today a very interesting program. So we have in total three sessions. So the first session with a keynote by Adam. I will give an introduction about it very shortly. And then we have two technical sessions about time and use and on the web, as well as a session on temporal networks and models. And we will conclude the whole workshop with a discussion and a panel at the end of this afternoon. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, we have today um, a keynote by Adam Yato. Uh, actually, Adam is one of the colleagues which I met at uh, one of my fir or at my first uh, web conference, which I was attending in Madrid, Spain, uh, that days when Adam was running the Wyckoff workshop. Uh, but today, well, our well research areas have slightly changed, and now Adam is. Um, a uh, full professor of the Department of Computer Science and Digital Science Center at the University of Innsbruck. Uh, before he had a well, longer career in Japan where he actually graduated and afterwards he basically worked at the Kyoto University as an assistant and later associate professor. Uh, he also is well serving as a gen general co-chair of uh, many conferences in the field of digital libraries and information retrieval. And today he is actually presenting our works on, or his work, or to us, our his works on temporal question answering in news articles and collections. And we are actually keen on seeing well his work and how to basically deal with this huge amount of data that is well needed to be processed and well when it comes and to see what are the challenges to basically support these question answering approaches in particular if there are yeah, well open uh, queries or open domain questions to be answered. And last but not least, he will also introduce a large scale question answering uh, data set that has been automatically created, spanning more than two decades of news articles. And well, we are all interested in his presentation uh, today. So I can see now more and more people are joining the session. Well, and it's my pleasure now to well, uh, hand over and leave the floor to Adam, and we will listen to your presentation. Please, Adam, uh, share your screen, open your mic, and uh, let's go. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me here, and uh, welcome, everybody. Just a second, I will start sharing very soon. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, perfectly fine. Good. So let's start then. Um, yeah. So the title is Temporal Question Answering in News Article Collections. And as um, Mark already mentioned, there are um, several, several parts of this talk. Um, the last one will be about the data set. And the, um, the first two parts will be about the actual methods to a solve question answering in, in the news article collections. But let me start first with a background. So um, as you all know, these days we have a lot of um, data online, obviously, but uh, this data is also accumulated over time uh, in a form of uh, archives, uh, news archives or some corpora, um, even uh, web scientific, sorry, scientific paper, 
archives or even even social media archives and and, and obviously there is also web archive a huge amount of data and the um, common point of it is that it's temporal aspect because this data is over time being uh, either um, collected from from already digital form or it is subject to OCR and um, digitized basically so that analog data can be um, converted to, to digital uh, form. We have a lot of such collections over time spanning a um, couple of decades. Uh, they are obviously continuously growing. This is our heritage. And as you can see, the, the genres of documents are very diverse. Um, some numbers, just to prove my point, um, you can see that we have like millions of uh, newspaper pages in one project called Chronicling America, where many news articles about the USA are uh, collected together at one place. We have also archives for, for certain um, newswire sources like Times, The Times, or New York Times, also um, in a range of millions of news articles spanning in this, in this case, actually more than two centuries, as we see Google Books, Internet Archive, where we have a lot of um, past uh, versions of web pages um, contained. Even, even Amazon is releasing an archive of product reviews spanning um, 20 years with 142 million product reviews data sets. So this is kind of like archival data, as you can see here, in a digital format open to the public. We can get some useful information from there, obviously. And also, apart from, from these online activities, we cannot forget about uh, national libraries and national archives, which have their own digital collections, or at least are proceeding to, to provide. And, and there's a big cost actually involved in this. You, you can see this example of a Japanese national diet library spent so much money on digitization. So obviously, um, these institutions are happy to um, provide convenient access to, to their data. Um, because uh, despite this massive data, huge costs which are uh, put into collecting such data, especially from the institutions that I just mentioned, national libraries, for example, the number of users is still small because um, we believe the problem is just too much data, too hard to find uh, useful information there and not user-friendly uh, interfaces uh, to this. So in the long term, um, my lab wants to basically popularize this kind of archives by opening them up uh, to make them more user friendly to um, average users, not just professionals. Um, we can talk about news article archives, scientific paper, any any temporal data over time collected spanning decades or uh, centuries in digital form. Uh, we would like to make it very accessible to the users. And um, Currently, the interfaces are basically standard IR interfaces. We might have this kind of large document archive, let's say here, and, and user might have certain query. For example, this could be news articles, and the query might be um, portable music devices in 1980s that the user want to research. Maybe this is a student writing a master a thesis on, on a, um, technology and, and music listening devices over time and want to just learn something about this and search results that will be obtained are basically retrieved by standard IR algorithm as most of the time um, available in, in this kind of archives, probably BM25 or cosine similarity. And then, well, reading all this news um, or any type of documents, of course, is, is troublesome for the user, difficult to make sense of results because they come from different time points obviously, maybe even from different sources as well. And the context is different over time, right? If we jump suddenly from 85 to the year 87 or 89, uh, perhaps different different uh, context, different information is needed to understand the results, right? Um, so basically, this is good for professionals, but we need more user-friendly solutions if a user is not really professional, just want to learn something from the past, uh, collect some data, uh, useful information, find, and so on. So our um, goal um, for, for the last years in, in my lab was to provide um, question-answering interface. So the user can ask natural language questions like we do when we talk to our friends of, or acquaintances. 
and then we can get an answer. This is the most natural for user way of um, information seeking, just asking natural uh, question. And you can see examples of questions that we that we cared about um, taking from our data set actually. Uh, in this table, for example, what bill was signed by Clinton for firearms purchases, which party led by, I'm not sure I pronounce well, but Putelezi threatened to boycott our South African elections. You see this type of, this type of questions um, and we need an answer to them like, like here, you can see the answers. And they they come from from actual um, years as indicated on the last column. Um, so this sort of question answering interface to to large news archive, for example, uh, we think it could be useful uh, for for of course for professionals like historians, uh, journalists writing um, perhaps some uh, some article, and and they they may want to to connect to the past uh, certain informations. Um, or even for employees in insurance finance fields to assess the risk by finding past events and uh, understanding them uh, by by basically zooming to certain article that, that contains the answer, or perhaps taking just an answer um, directly. And of course, average users can also benefit from this kind of interface. But um, how to realize this kind of question answering system is not easy because we have a temporal uh, dimension here. Um, question answering in itself uh, is it's a rather long, um, old, uh, I should say, old research, and perhaps not so old like document summarization, but for a couple of decades already people uh, worked in, in NLP especially, but also in IR on providing effective systems to, to answer natural questions. But usually the subject collection was rather not uh, strongly uh, spanning over time, not uh, not a diachronic connection, not a diachronic collection, but synchronic, like Wikipedia, for example, or uh, perhaps a couple of months long uh, data set of news. But what we need is a solution for um, diachronic collection that spans decades or perhaps even even centuries in the far future. Um, and this this fits into open domain question answering, where uh, a question has to be answered from a collection, not from any document, because initially, uh, that is what I didn't mention, initially the Q&A research was focusing on one particular document and there was a question that was supposed to be answered from that document. Obviously, for open domain Q&A, you don't have any specific document, you just have an underlying collection uh, of documents and the answer needs to be collected from there. Um, and as I said, uh, most of the research was done on Wikipedia or other synchronic types of documents, not on a temporal collections. So we um, initiated work um, in, in this kind of um, uh, environment. And uh, this is the agenda of today's talk. After, after this short background that I gave you, I will start discussing first unsupervised Q&A approach in this kind of context, then uh, a method to better estimate a time of events, um, which may be mentioned in questions, and finally, a large-scale open domain Q&A data set that we just finished um, building. And uh, feel free, by the way, to, to stop me uh, whenever something is unclear. I would be happy to answer uh, your questions. But let's start with the uh, first approach, um, um, which uh, we done in, in 2020. Um, we built a system called Kana, just question answering in news archives, as you can see here visualized um, uh, briefly, where user ask a question and then the system is collecting uh, answers from a large collection of news. We used a New York Times um, data set that spans uh, two decades, and the answer should be uh, like this. Um, this is the solution which is unsupervised, as I mentioned, because at that time we didn't have any a uh, convenient data set, uh, that one was built later. So we tried with the simplest approaches uh, to this problem. Uh, here is the um, snapshot um, of, the, of the pipeline of the system. So basically we have, um, this is actually quite standard framework that we have IR module to retrieve documents from the collection, considering the question from the user. 
And then we have a, a here on the right hand side a document a reader a module where the question is um, taken so that the answer is is extracted from candidate documents, the top rank documents. But in our system, and this is specific uh, to our system, which uh, I think um, is, is the meat of, of our research here, the, we provided this re-ranking module in the middle that um, takes the, the top uh, results returned by IR um, component at the beginning, but later re-ranks them uh, so that better candidate documents can be uh, collected for, for a document reader module to extract answers from them. So I will mainly focus on this time aware re-ranking module that is our added contribution um, to this research. Um, so the, the question is like this, given millions of past documents, um, how to select a small set of candidate articles that will provide answer to user question? Um, before I start describing the, um, the actual method uh, that was for this uh, temporal re-ranking, uh, I want to um, indicate that we have two types of, the, uh, of questions uh, here. One type of questions are those that contain a time expression. For example, here you can see the top three questions have the date um, indicated. We call them explicitly time scope questions, but other questions do not have any time expression and um, they are called implicitly time scope questions where, well, we don't know to what time period we should sort of zoom in to, to extract the answer for this question. So we consider them harder than the, uh, the first uh, type of questions. And, um, while the solutions that we, we provide uh, focus on both types, we especially focus on the uh, second type, so-called implicitly time scope questions, because we think they are more challenging, interesting, uh, and also difficult for the research, because we first need to estimate to what time period in the collection we should look at to, to find the answer. Um, so, uh, let me describe the, the method. So, uh, first we retrieve um, documents for the user uh, question. This is actually a standard a step. Uh, you, when you have a long question, you typically remove uh, stop words, um, some meaningless terms. Uh, so we, we used a keyword selection approach, YAG, um, to extract the most important words from the question and then formulate a query, the query that could be sent to uh, underlying news archive. And here we just use standard BM25 search to find some top end candidate documents. And then um, second step is uh, this re-ranking uh, approach because uh, we, we should consider temporal factor um, to re-rank candidate documents rather than just standard BM25. So we started looking into um, temporal distribution of documents returned by BM25 and trying to find some kind of peaks, as you can see here, for these two example questions indicated in, in a red color, um, so that we probably will um, pick up those documents that are published somewhere around the peak, um, detected peak, and put them at the top of the candidate list from where, where the answer should be extracted, rather than just use relevance-based uh, ranking. So uh, these two example questions are actually not so difficult because you see rather clear peaks. There's one peak for the first question. Uh, Lewinsky told whom about her relationship with President Clinton. Uh, for the second one, we actually have two peaks, but they are close to each other. Um, so, well, one observation could be, let's look for the answer somewhere, somewhere here, right? Uh, rather than at other uh, time points. And by the way, the event itself, which is indicated by this blue small cross, um, as you can see, happened during the, the peaks. So um, it's actually a good example of, of questions that, that, that we see now. Um, by the way, they are obviously implicitly time scope questions, so we don't have any date. That's why we, we do this sort of um, peak analysis to, to understand where answer could be, where the event also happened. Um, and the question's time scope, because that's what we wanted to find. What is the time scope of the question? It will be represented by the set of time periods, because as you can see here in the second example, this is not just one peak, but two peaks. So there are two time periods that could be um, considered as a, as a question's time scope. 
but uh, the situation is in reality much harder because uh, we may have more than two, even even ten or or so um, peaks. So, in these examples, you see that, um, for example, the last uh, question: which English football team had nine players arrested in Spain for alleged uh, sexual assault? You can see that there are many peaks here, right? So, situation is not easy. We we don't know where where the answer might be. Obviously, we could um, we could just use relevance uh, of of these documents because this is distribution of relevant document shown here. But we think the temporal factor is is very important here, especially during the peak. Um, the answer is likely to to be found. Uh, but but how to rerank uh, considering so many uh, peaks is not uh, clear. So that's why. Um, we propose basically two hypotheses for uh, effective re-ranking of documents. The first hypothesis is, uh, as you can see on the uh, on the figure here, that once we establish this question time scope, so basically we pick up all the periods corresponding to peaks, call them question time scope, then the document which is closer to this question time scope is more relevant for us and is more likely to contain the answer. The answer to the question, right? So here, document A being closer to the question time scope is more likely um, to be a good candidate document than document B. This is a very simple uh, hypothesis, simple scoring rule, but as we found later, it helps to um, produce um, good results. And by the way, question time scope, uh, as you remember from the previous slide, may not be just one time period, but it could be a set of time periods. So obviously we need um, techniques to, to cover for multiple time periods. Uh, then the second hypothesis is that within the content of documents, we often have temporal expressions like this last year, for example, or in another uh, document we see in July 2000 or on July 2025. So we have this temporal information um, that is um, giving us a clue um, where the event basically happened, right? So, so this this question here is how many people were killed in Concorde crash in 2000, and we see that perhaps this last year is not very useful, but July 2000, July 25, these are temporal expressions that could be utilized for for our re-ranking uh, approach because they tell um, when the event happened, and and the answer should be probably somewhere close to the event. So the, the second hypothesis um, that we have is that if a document uh, like, like this document B uh, in, in our figure uh, contains uh, time expressions which fall into estimated question time scope, like these two red color dates, then we think this document is more likely to contain the answer um, than other document uh, that, that has time expressions pointing elsewhere. So DB here should be scored higher than the A and perhaps should be re-ranked um, so that it is on the top uh, of, of the candidate list. And, and we would look more into document B for the answer to our question than for the document A. Um, so um, we, we used here in this particular case, a kernel density estimation to, to compute overlap, the overlap of document time expressions. Uh, with the question time scope. And since the, the, the time scope can be containing multiple uh, time periods, we need it as some aggregation way. And I spare you the mathematics, which you can find in, in, the, uh, in our cited papers. And just I will discuss the, the method briefly here from a uh, general viewpoint. So these two hypotheses correspond to two uh, scores that each document will have. And we just merge them um in this uh, averaging way um so then a document has has its temporal score but we are thinking that relevance signal in itself is also useful not only these temporal scores as as shown in the first uh, first equation can be useful but also how relevant is the document to, to the question itself is still a useful signal so we should combine it the standard relevance score with our computed uh, temporal score using alpha uh, parameter, like in a, a linear uh, interpolation. However, this alpha parameter, we decided not to keep it fixed, uh, but we bound it to uh, basically 
distribution of documents and the number of peaks uh, which were detected in uh, uh, in the in temporal distribution of these documents. For example, when we have a, a question like this, where there is only one clear peak, um, we will use uh, alpha uh, very very high so that only temporal score is considered and relevance uh, perhaps not or just to the small extent. In the case where we have this kind of situation with many peaks, so we are not sure about the time or wh where to look at, right? Um, then we put more weight to the relevance of, of a document rather than uh, temporality. So this is all um, dynamically decided, right? This combination of relevance and, and our temporal scores, which I just introduced in the previous slides. Uh, and then finally, we do re-ranking based on this uh, computed document score and apply um, uh, the answer um, finding method, which is DRQA uh, approach. That is a standard um, QA approach. Once you have certain text, uh, you just look for the answer span and, uh, using this approach. But uh, as I said, uh, what we focus in this research was re-ranking documents to know from where we actually should look for the answer. And finding the answer itself is already uh, provided using the RQA method. Um, then, since we will have uh, answer from each document, from each of the top uh, re-ranked documents, we just choose the most common answer as the final one. Um, so let me now discuss um, experiments. Uh, for for this uh, for this particular approach, so we use New York Times annotated corpus. As I said, it spans two decades. It's close to two million news articles, a bit less than that. And then, since this was the first time um, we did research on on the uh, news archive, uh, we didn't have any test set. So uh, we decided to create ourselves um, questions. 500 explicitly and 500 implicitly time scope questions. So uh, 500 uh, questions with temporal expressions and 500 without temporal expressions. How we collected them or created them. So we basically looked into uh, websites that contain history quizzes. Um, we look into Wikipedia pages. We also extracted some questions from existing uh, data sets, Q&A data sets. And, um, by this, we manually created a test set of um, thousand questions and their answers, right? So each question was associated with the answer. Then we um, run uh, our approach, Kana, um, on, on this, uh, uh, these two uh, sub, uh, sub data sets uh, with temporal expressions and without. And also, as you can see here, we tested Kana uh, with only one component like publication date. Uh, so the first hypothesis or the uh, temporal expressions embedded, which is the second hypothesis. And Kana later, the last uh, row indicates a system with both um, temporal hypotheses. As you can see that exact match EM and F1 score are the best when we apply our system, um, better than um, degraded versions without certain hypotheses, and also better than um, two baselines, which were here uh, indicated. Um, this uh, figure shows that our solution for alpha to be dynamically changing, depending on a, a time series shape, was always better than fixing uh, alpha to, to certain value. Um, this uh, dashed line indicates uh, dynamic alpha using uh, compared to um, solid lines, which which is for a certain particular alpha decided for all uh, test set. Um, what we also did in, in this uh, research is comparing uh, if our thousand questions that we prepared, uh, whether they can be just answered by Wikipedia, because someone might say, oh, why, why do we need even Q&A on temporal archives? Because Wikipedia is so large, we can just find any historical information from there. So we tested this. Uh, as you can see, here is DRQA with Wiki and uh, DRQA with New York Times and our Kana. So um, in, in, in the case of the top one result, indeed, EM uh, was better for Wikipedia, but for all other settings, uh, we found that using our system Kana on actual archive, um, news archive is better than, than Wikipedia 
mainly because uh, Wikipedia does not contain answers to some more minor questions. Although most of the test questions we produced were rather on uh, important events. But still, you can see here that Wikipedia is not enough for uh, this kind of research. So that was the first part, and um, there are two more, so I will move on to the second part. And this research was published last year at CIGAR, and the idea is that um, we wanted to improve this time scope estimation. Um, as, as you remember, this time scope estimation was just done by burst detection in our first method. But we think that burst detection is a too naive approach. Uh, there might be some periodical events, recurring events, or simply some events are so minor that there is no redundancy that, that will cause any, any sort of burst, which we can detect later in the, in the time series graph. So we um, try to solve this with a neural network. And um, basically, uh, this, this falls into the research called event occurrence time uh, prediction. Uh, there were some also researchers on that, so this is not just a novel task. Um, but for our purpose of question answering, we thought that precisely estimating the time scope uh, of a question to what time period the question refers to may be very helpful for, for finding the, the correct answer. So we especially focus on this uh, component. Um, and as I said, this is related to event occurrence time prediction. Um, event occurrence time in itself has been exploited in uh, many um, NLP or IR tasks like uh, search results, di uh, diversification, timeline construction, historical event ordering, and so on. And there is some body of the research uh, for that. But most of the works um, do not use um, any temporal um, collection of documents. They just use uh, synchronic data like uh, Wikipedia um, or, or some other resources. Um, and, and, and most of them do not apply neural network solution. So anyway, uh, the task that we formulated uh, for this particular research is like this. A given a short description of an event, which in our case is a question, right? But it could be actually any uh, any text, it doesn't have to be questioned um, especially. And given also the required temporal granularity, because we may say the answer should be with uh, day information or month information or just the year information, right? And given also the temporal news collection, we need to find the occurrence time of this event, uh, which, is, which is described in our short text. It's the best to show an example. So let's say we have such a sentence. Okay, it's not a question, it's just a sentence, but it's fine. A bombing of a super ferry by Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines killed 116, right? And we want to uh, have the answer in months granularity and uh, collected from New York Times news archive. Maybe not collected, just computed, I should say, because um, we don't do actual uh, question answering approach. It will be just sort of prediction uh, research, right? Um, so given this uh, setting, the answer would be 2004 um, February because we set monthly, gran monthly granularity. And this is not a question, it's just a sentence, but if you just add a question mark or reformulate it as a question, um, that's, that's of course still um, applicable for, for our uh, setting. So how to um, solve this, uh, this task, um, but um, yeah, before I will describe the actual uh, framework, let me uh, still show some more examples. Uh, as you can see here, uh, some of the uh, even descriptions are quite short, like maybe five or six uh, words, which are not stop words, but nevertheless, we still need to extract, I mean, compute the time uh, when these events happened. And um, many of the of the events that we collected for our test set are actually not in Wikipedia, or they might be in Wikipedia, but only perhaps year information without months and the information. So uh, we prepared a, a test set, which I will later talk about, that is um, challenging in a sense that you can't simply answer it using Wikipedia data, but you need to look into the actual news archive, which uh, spans the, the, the uh, corresponding uh, time period. Um, so the setting is now like this, right? We have this um, event description, 
than from a New York Times, because again, we use the, the, the same collection of New York Times. We um, do computing and provide the answer like here. Um, so in our approach, uh, we, um, we use a multivariate time series analysis. So given, given the sentence uh, representing event, uh, we again retrieve some, some relevant documents from our news collection, but then, uh, um, but then um, instead of looking into, um, looking into actual answer spans and trying to extract something by question answering approach, we just generated time series, multivariate time series, actually four of them. And based on this time series, we will later build a neural network that will predict um, a date uh, when the event happened. What kind of time series? Um, so publication date time series, this is just a standard a temporal distribution of, of relevant documents for, for this um, sentence. Uh, content date time series, so we also extracted from documents any temporal expressions and uh, build a time series from that. And then later two time series, which are um, the similarity based. So how similar are uh, the documents or a sentences containing time expression to the actual um, event related sentence that was input. Having these four time series, uh, we wanted to extract information when the event, uh, well, predict the information when the event could happen. And, and here we use transformer with uh, convolutional layers uh, and uh, embedding averaging layer to produce the final event occurrence time. Um, so I will talk now about the um, evaluation of, of this, uh, this method. The data set is the same New York Times uh, as in the previous uh, research, uh, but for the test set, we collected even descriptions from Wikipedia. So Wikipedia have this kind of year pages where uh, for any year, uh, let's say 1977, you have all the major events that happened in this year in the form of uh, one or two sentences. So we just extracted these sentences and the, the actual uh, year uh, to, to have about 22,000 event descriptions, short descriptions of events with the years that uh, these events occurred. But actually not on the years, we also collected months and the information which was also available in these uh, pages because as you, as you uh, remember, um, in, in the previous slides, uh, the input was also in the form of specified granularity, which, which we want. Uh, whether we want months and year information, or just year, or perhaps also day uh, to be returned. And the distribution of these events is like this, so just uh, about 20 years. Um, and here you can see the results on the left-hand side, the main results. Um, uh, this is the accuracy of a day prediction. So um, if you if you just take a look at the first row, it's a random guess. Uh, if you want to randomly guess uh, day information of the events uh, in our test set, your accuracy will be like 0.01% per, uh, percent because there are so many days in, in 20 years long time period. But if we, uh, we, if we apply our method, temp trans, we have accuracy uh, boosted to 16.42%. Uh, uh, then there is a mean average error here also indicated. And you see that we tested four granularities, day, week, month, and year, always having the best results and quite uh, higher than um, most of the baselines uh, here. Um, all of the baselines uh, here, yeah. And then uh, we also did ablation study by removing some of the time series. You remember there were four time series. Let's say we only use publication date or maybe content date or combination of the two time series. And as you see, accuracy is not that high um, when compared to, set, to the setting where all the time series are used, the last row, right? So that means that these four time series that we produced from the archive for this even description that was tested um, are, are useful, all of them are useful. We should use them all for, uh, for the input to the transformer. And uh, a little bit more of the uh, results. Um, here is accuracy versus the top K results that we use. So uh, for all these time series, we, we utilize certain top K results of, of the documents. Uh, the documents were of course returned by um, BM25 uh, retrieval first, 
but how many of them you utilize to build time series is a hyperparameter. Uh, the less number of top K results you use, uh, probably you, you may not capture all the information. But on the other hand, the more uh, these top K results you use, you will start adding noise, right? So as you can see, most of the baselines actually um, require about five or, or 10 uh, top K documents to be uh, used. But uh, the more you, uh, you use documents, the, there is a more noise and this method degrade. However, our method was quite robust for the noise. As you can see, even if you increase top K uh, results, still we have a high accuracy. Um, so that was a positive aspect here. Uh, we also tried to solve the task using uh, traditional question answering framework when we just uh, revert this, this event and um, well convert it to the question itself, right? So when the bombing happened, let's say, instead of just having a sentence, the bombing happened and so on. And then just use standard question answering framework like DRQA with um, IR comp the IR component like BM25. But we found that, as you can see, accuracy is quite low. So we need this um, time series building and then uh, transformer uh, approach to provide a good, uh, good answer. Just question answering itself cannot uh, provide us information on the date of events. And um, here are some uh, examples of um, events that our system was not uh, providing good answer. Let's look at the first one. Actually, the, the, the first event is very well specific, particular, and uh, we found that even though it was in the test set, it was not uh, in the New York Times collection. So it was impossible for our system to answer when this event happened. That's why the estimated time, as you see, is quite well, six years uh, um, overshoot it or, or farther from the actual occurrence time. Then the second event, the flu outbreak in Britain puts pressure on NHS. Well, this is a periodical event because probably every year there is this pressure on national health system. So it's very difficult or impossible perhaps to provide an answer when, when this event happened. Uh, we had about five years difference from the actual grand truth date of this. And the last example is interesting. Uh, Turing, Italy is awarded 2006 Winter Olympics. Um, our system answers 2006 uh, because Winter, Oli Winter Olympics was in 2006 in, in Turin. But actually, this event is about awarding, um, um, I mean, occurrence of, of awarding itself. So several years before the Olympics, which is like, as you can see, seven years before. But the system was misled by this uh, 2006 and uh, many documents which associate Turin, Italy, Winter Olympics with the year 2006, not with the uh, awarding time. Um, and the final results that I want to show you is that we extended our Kana system, which you have uh, just seen in the previous um, subset of, of the slides, uh, by adding this um, a time scope uh, estimation um, component as you and, and as you can see here we managed to improve the results so just not um, I mean just using burst detection is not uh, the best solution we we need some more refined approach to estimate um, to what time period sort of we should zoom in uh, to find the candidate documents uh, for answer uh, extraction um, rather than just using burst detection, we can use neural network approaches as we just uh, have seen. And uh, this brings me to the last uh, part of the of my presentation uh, about uh, building large-scale Q&A data set for, for this uh, task of um, question answering on, on archives. Uh, the previous approach was um, unsupervised um, and we felt like uh, there is a need to um, to have a large collection so we can basically use supervised approaches. And we first look into what are the existing Q&A data sets and what are their sizes. And this particular graph is taken from the uh, survey from last year. You see that um, there's a lot, first of all, uh, question answering data sets. 
Um, and uh, most of them are about 100,000 uh, questions to 200,000 uh, questions. Most of them are actually manually done. So this is not surprising that we don't have numbers like um, half a million or a million, uh, at least not for most of the data sets. Some of the data sets here are quite large. Um, so we wanted to build our data set uh, so that it's also, let's say, half a million uh, close um, amount of questions. It can be sufficient for training complex uh, solutions. Um, and we wanted it to be built from the archive, right? News archive, uh, which is spanning um, several years or, or decades. Um, but most of these uh, data sets are actually on, on either Wikipedia or a very short collection of uh, new or perhaps on scientific papers or some other type of documents. So they were not useful for us. Um, you actually can see the uh, document types here, Reddit, Science, um, Wikipedia, Common Sense, and so on. This, uh, this plot just shows what kind of documents are uh, the basis for these data sets here. Um, so um, what I will show you now is a data set called Archival QA. Uh, in, in the end, we managed to have half a million uh, question answer pairs plus also paragraph information, and it spans uh, from 87 to 2007, so 20 years, because we use New York Times uh, archive, the same that you have seen already in the uh, previous slides. Uh, these are actually the closest data sets to ours. Um, uh, some of them, as you can see, are also on the news and a little bit diachronic, but still not that long as in our case. Uh, not 20 years uh, spanning, and they are rather small. Or this one, even though it's 1 million, but actually it's a closed style uh, data set. So just one word is masked, and then the, the problem is converted to basically unmasking the word, predicting what is this word. But it's not proper question answering where you would have a question and an answer. It's just a uh, predict what is the word hidden um, in a document. So that was not a good data set. So we wanted to uh, to build um, something from our, on our news archive and large enough. Uh, however, um, because of the lack of resources, we couldn't do it in a manual way. So we decided for automatic generation of a data set. Um, and let me um, let me start now describing how this was done. So we used a question generation uh, techniques which can generate a question automatically given some paragraphs. And this research, uh, although not that popular as question answering, but it has been going already for a couple of years and it's um, in a quite good state in a sense that you can utilize existing solutions with quite good results. Uh, for example, a sentence like this, Adam makes a presentation today, you automatically generate a question like this, who makes a presentation today? So our idea was to use state-of-the-art question generation solutions to generate automatically questions um, in order to help question answering research later, right? Of course, uh, someone might say that these questions are sort of, um, well, not human-like or more synthetic-like questions. Uh, that's true, but since we have a large of them, um, half a million, they might be still very useful for training um, systems, right? Even for pre-training, perhaps systems, uh, and then fine-tuning on a smaller manual, uh, manually made collection of uh, question answers. Still, this kind of large data sets can be useful. So, um, in our solution, we collected um, data from New York Times and also use Wikipedia here. I will explain uh, for what purpose. Um, and then uh, we, we generated questions, but um, we use also aggressive filtering, like these three modules here I, are, are, are basically um, done here in order to filter wrong questions because you use automatic approach. So obviously some questions will be not um, well formulated or irrelevant and we need to just remove them. So the idea was to generate many questions first and then aggressively filter them so that in the end you have a good um, data set, I mean reasonably good, uh, where you have this question, its answer and the paragraph from where the answer was extracted. 
this could be used for uh, training some uh, question answering um, neural network based models. Um, so um, first we we collected um, uh, we collected documents from um, New York Times, but we didn't know how to collect them. So uh, two sets of well, two types of of collection. One is the the random selection of news articles uh, to generate questions from. And second is uh, based on Wikipedia events. So we just collected some important events mentioned in Wikipedia year pages and used them to find articles. And then from these articles, news articles, we, we generated questions. Uh, the objective he, here was that we wanted to have some important events um, and also some minor events and, and for both of them to have questions. So the data set is uh, diversified in this aspect. Um, for question generation module, we use T5, which was fine-tuned on Squad 1.1, and uh, as an answer, we always use entity, um, entity like location or person or uh, organization. So the question was always centered on an entity, but this is quite common setting because um, these kind of questions are factoid and, um, yeah, uh, quite uh, quite easy to to be built um so the first uh, filtering module was based on syntactic and temporal information uh, if the generated question uh, didn't end with question mark or was too long like more than 30 tokens or too short then it was removed or perhaps um, there were some unclear pronouns like the question here when did he become the president of course it's impossible to answer this question so this is not a good instance of data that, that should be put into our final data set uh, so we, we remove this kind of uh, uh, questions uh, we also had the cases of um, uh, implicit temporal information like for example last year here in the question how many votes did president clinton have in new jersey last year well this is not good so we converted this last year to absolute date based on a, um, some reasoning module that utilizes document publication uh, date. And also the answers should not contain uh, this um, relative temporal expressions, but they should be converted to uh, absolute ones. Um, next filtering um, was based on content specificity and temporal ambiguity. So let me explain this too um the content specificity you can see the, these two sentence examples uh, you can see that the first one is rather general like there is no particular specific information in, in it on the other hand the second sentence contain uh, location names like european japanese and some year some percentage numbers is very specific uh, question so we wanted to have um, data set containing this kind of specific questions rather than general because it's harder or impossible to answer such general questions that's why we um, designed this um, mo this filtering module that will distinguish between general and specific uh, questions and we remove the general ones um, here we we didn't build uh, this um, data set ourselves but we used um, a paper that was published in uh, AAAI and they provided data set of uh, 4,000 over um, sentences that are annotated with general or specific labels. We used uh, Roberta Pay's uh, classifier, and with accuracy of 84%, we could distinguish if a question that was generated by T5 in the, in the previous step was general or specific, and then we remove all the uh, general ones. And then next filtering was based on temporal ambiguity so let's see examples like here um the question like who was the senator of west virginia obviously there were many senators over 20 years long time period for which we built uh, our data set so this is like temporally ambiguous example of a question or what country is the current u.s policy to, uh, current u.s policy we don't know what current means uh, it's just 20 years or uh, how many points does Ashley McHinley have? Again, this is not specific for any year, for any game. So we think these are not good uh, questions that should be removed. 
On the other hand, question like here, how old was um, Evangeline Sabin when she died? Well, this is uh, not ambiguous in a temporal way. So these kind of questions could be retained. Um, since this is rather a, a novel problem, uh, we, we build our own data set of uh, 5,000 over uh, manual annotated questions, uh, whether they are ambiguous temporally or uh, inambiguous uh, temporally. And then we again use bird base with a classifier and about 81% accuracy. And based on this classifier, we removed all these temporarily ambigu ambiguous questions like you can see here. And the final filtering module was not only looking in the questions as the previous filtering modules, but also considering answer and paragraph. So just a, a final um, triples that we are supposed to, to deliver. And then uh, this, this filtering module was just based on combination of uh, these data pieces. Um, we, we build our own data set again, manually labeling as good or bad um, um, questions based on uh, observations. If a question has correct answer or incorrect, if a question is containing information that is actually in the paragraphs, so all this kind of sanity check, the final data check, uh, that was done after previous modules. And again, we had a classifier here for filter, but uh, for filtering, but um, ripples with accuracy of 86 point um, percent. And um, this is the final um, statistics of the, of the data set. It's uh, more than half a million questions. Um, they are distributed over time like this. Uh, you can see some examples here. Uh, what's red prompt Mr. Panic's family to, to flee to Hong Kong, who claimed responsibility for the bombing of Bab Azor? Right, you have an answer here. Um, there is also original answer because, as you can see, some of the temporal expressions needed to be converted. Uh, some paragraph ID information and some more uh, more pieces of information. Um, here is the overview of what kind of name entities form uh, the answers. So mainly there were persons, but actually still quite many organizations, states and geopolitical entities. So this is fairly uh, well uniform, perhaps not uniform, but good distribution of different name entities that, that we had. Uh, here we also used a module to determine what are the event types uh, behind the questions. And as you can see, mainly they are uh, arts and culture, politics and elections and armed conflicts and attacks as indicated in this uh, pie chart. Here you can see a trigram prefixes of the questions. Um, there are quite many questions like what was there or what is or who did, who was. It? This is a standard way to uh, describe uh, um, Q and A data set, and um, as you can see, this is also a quite good distribution. We don't have just one type of questions dominating um, too much uh, the entire data set. Um, we also applied several models on this data set, um, and we found that the best result is for Bert Serini uh, with a resolution of temporal information. And dense retrieval was actually not so well performing compared to uh, traditional uh, retrieval, like keyword matching, like BM25. And um, the, the, the last thing that I want to mention is that we uh, divided this uh, data set, so half a million questions, into uh, smaller sub data sets, um, those that contain time expression or do not have time expressions or uh, questions which are easy versus those that are hard. And easy and hard, the distinction here was based on um, the observation if a paragraph containing answer is returned in the top uh, 10 documents or is not returned in the top 10 documents for a particular question. Uh, we think that uh, if uh, this paragraph with, with an answer is not returned um, using standard BM25, in the top documents, that means it's rather hard to answer uh, such a question. As you can see, examples here, uh, easy, difficult, uh, with temporal expression or without temporal expression. So you have different sub data sets 
perhaps to, to test uh, in a more detailed way any any Q and A system uh, versus, for example, uh, temporary information included in in the questions or cases where there is no such information, and so on. And um, we also tested our models on on these sub data sets, as you can see, for example, for hard, the answers are. And uh, not that easily to be found. So EM and F1 uh, scores are lower than for the easy case. And uh, what was also interesting that the case of time information included in questions results in a, a lower uh, accuracy and not accuracy, but uh, exact match and F1 score than the case where there is no time information. So this time information can be actually misleading at least for this baseline that we use here, um, which are not in any way uh, adapted to temporal information. These are the standard uh, Q&A uh, settings. Um, okay, so that would be uh, the last slide. What I have uh, presented um, in my talk is a novel task of open domain question answering on temporal document collections. Um, we proposed uh, first unsupervised approach uh, based on two temporal hypotheses, as, as you perhaps remember. And then we refined this approach by um, proposing a better way, neural network based way of estimating um, question time scope, which was based on multivariate time series analysis. And um, finally, we introduced a, a QA data set, uh, large scale, so uh, close to half a million over half a million uh, question answer pairs, which are automatically generated from, from New York Times uh, corpus and which are readily available for anyone that want to um, foster this, uh, this, uh, this kind of research on um, answering questions from, from news archives. So that would be my uh, last slide. Um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Many thanks to you, Adam, for this very interesting and comprehensive keynote speak, speech. So we have now time for some questions. And I'm asking the audience, please, if you have any questions, please do so. And uh, well, uh, come up and uh, let me know if you uh, uh, have questions. But uh, before the others, um come up maybe i have the opportunity to ask you uh, one or two questions that directly um, uh, come up um so uh, by the, before we start um, abhishek told me participants can post their queries here or raise their hands uh, on the q a uh, session and then we can um, uh, start them but i will start first with some question so when you basically did the first part, so more or less on event summarization or identifying what is the most relevant document, right? Yeah. So, um, so for me, it appeared to be, or I mean, just uh, just being a bit provocative, uh, saying, well, if you do this um, summarization thing, isn't it most necessary or not necessarily the case that the newest, the freshest document basically uh, is better than older ones because it basically well uh, is able to uh, capture all the information that are already uh, contained a bit of a well um, uh, or inherently summarized document. So how uh, did you experience something uh, like that, or uh, what is basically uh, your observation here? Yeah, very good question indeed. This is the problem, um, but um, well. The, there can be the case of a very specific question asking about some details. And usually these details of, of an event will not be sort of remembered later um, because only most important information is kind of retained later. But these kind of details will be very close to the event. So just taking, let's say, the last document relevant and getting an answer from there may not be sufficient because we may be asking about some very minor thing about the event which is just recorded very close to the event, uh, maybe even during the event time, because later you might just have some very general 
vague references to the event. Okay, the event happened five years ago. That, that's it. But without maybe telling, I don't know, what was the wind perhaps at the time when this ferry, um, uh, you know, sank. Uh, so, so for some type of questions, perhaps yes. For others, not. Currently, we are actually trying to estimate it. Uh, whether this freshness, I mean, <laughs> the the age of of a document is playing a role or not, and for what type of questions it plays a role. I so see. that's something that we are now trying to to estimate. True, uh, um, perfectly fine. Uh, I agree uh, with this thing. So I mean, it, as I told you, it was a bit of a provocative uh, question. Uh, on the other hand side, um, uh, let me turn it around and let's go uh, um, back to the event time detection. Uh, on the contrary here, so I basically have here the impression that the first guess or best uh, estimate would be basically to directly go uh, to the first occurrence of the, uh, uh, of the event here when it is named the first time. So what do you think here? Is it, isn't this a strong baseline or, or what did you experience here? Yeah, the, so you mean the first document that is relevant within, let's say, 100 uh, documents, right? The, the, the date of this first document could be, yeah, we didn't use it as a baseline, but I think it will not work so well because you have a very short description of an, of an event, right? It could be using very common words. And then just like in the case of this, um, what was this team? A British team, right, uh, accused for, for sexual misconduct, right? You have seen many peaks over time. So that means this kind of events or similar types of events may happen over time in different uh, years, right? So the system will be really confused. Um, and yeah, so, so we think that perhaps the, the neural network approach with transformer will itself understand when we should pay attention to the first document, when to the middle, when to the peak, when to the last. All this temporal information is given as an input to the transformer. And I think depending on the semantics of a question, well, not a question, but just the text, um, the neural network will itself understand if it should pay attention to the first relevant document or rather the peak or rather looking just at the shape of temporal distribution and then estimate the year. Yeah, but but uh, that's that's something that maybe we should investigate in the future. Thanks for the suggestion. Okay, so thank you. Um, one more time, uh, questions uh, from the audience. So is there somebody in the audience who wants to raise a question to Adam here? Um, I cannot see any question for the moment being. Can you see any question? Um, so uh, De Debarshi Kumar Sanyal has a question. Um, please. Can you see it in the chat? Uh, no, please uh, be so kind. Okay. And, uh, okay so uh, let me just read the question. So Adam, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I have this question. How is the burst detection cutoff determined in question time scope evaluation, uh, estimation? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So let me just go to here so we can see it uh, more visually. So we applied a, a method uh, proposed by Vlahos, uh, which is basically dependent on a um, moving average. As you can see, a solid line is a, here is a moving average. And uh, there is a threshold of, I think, two or three standard deviations from the moving average. So whenever there is a point in the line, um, like, like for example here, which is uh, over two standard deviations from the moving average in this particular time, the peak is detected, right? And, and there are many other approaches to peak detection because this is a well-known problem in time series analysis. So we could apply this one or another one. Uh, we use just this one because this was also utilized by us in our researches. Basically it's looking at the moving average and how fast you sort of overshoot above moving average. If it's more than two or three standard deviations, that's actually a, a parameter here, uh, then the peak is detected. Um, yeah, I don't have the precise answer now here, but um, 
yeah, but this just applied method by uh, proposed by by Vlahos and in, in the paper you can find the reference to it. I hope this answers the question. But as I said, any any peak detection approach could be utilized here um, based on the mean mean value uh, shift or or moving average or some other approaches perhaps applier detection and so on yeah okay thank you um can uh, the one uh, who raised the question please tell if uh, the answer uh, was uh, good enough or he wants to refine this question yeah deboshi here yeah thank you for the one answer i could follow what you wanted to say and i'll explore that paper and once again thank you very much for the very insightful talk I learned a lot of things from your talk. Thank you. Thanks. Well, one, one more thing which actually came to my mind and which I like very much is your uh, visualization of the archival QA. Can you please uh, just uh, go back to these things about the entities uh, and the entity uh, about the entities that are in there? So this was uh, actually quite interesting to me. And uh, which one was that? In which yeah. part? Uh, so was, this was at the end where you had archival QA where you showed this uh, trigram of the of the entities uh, these charts. Uh, no, uh, later on, later on, later on. I think um, this one. Yeah, uh, no. They, you had a, you had a nice graphical representation about the categories of uh, of the entities that are. Oh, this one. Yeah, yes. yeah. So just. Uh, so the categories, so these are the categories uh, where the article is uh, belonging to, uh, the question category distribution, so. Uh, this, this one, yeah, so this is, we take the questions and we basically, we had a classifier that is detecting one of these eight or nine, I forgot how many uh, classes of events. And we basically uh, classify a particular question that we take as an input to one of these classes and we do it for all 500,000 questions and then we build this pie chart here. So um, the data set for, for building the classifier was introduced by us in, in a prior research at ECIR conference. We just use it here to build the classifier and then we apply it on, on our final archival QA data set to see how many questions we have about, let's say, sport, Actually, sport is where SP, right? So a little bit about sport, how many about low and crime and so on. And anyone can download uh, the data set. We have a document data set for, for these categories, train the classifier, and then you can, well, process whatever you like. In our case, we just process archival QA, our final questions to see what events they are about. This is pretty nice. So actually, uh, this links uh, more or less to work which I have been recently doing with my students about well um, the semantics and uh, the, uh, the entity types, uh, as you might know, Adam, from uh, one of the PhD defenses. So it would be actually nice to link those things and potentially exploit uh, how this could be well uh, also used these events uh, or these, uh, these entity types inside the articles in order to detect what kind of uh, document you are dealing with and potentially also exploiting this information, right? Yes, I remember that research. Um, you, could, you could utilize because that would be like a complement to the uh, semantic approach that you used, right? Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, that would be uh, would be a nice twist to basically combine the, uh, the two words, if you wish, right? I mean, um, that would be pretty cool, yeah. Okay, once again, many thanks. So this is the last chance of I'm calling people for uh, a question. So is there in the audience somebody who wants to speak or wants to type uh, something into the board? I cannot see any other question for the moment being. So we are a bit ahead of time, but this gives us a few more minutes break before the next session starts. One more time, uh, many thanks to Adam for this very interesting and uh, inspiring keynote, which will be hopefully giving us a good uh, start into the workshop and the fruitful discussions uh, to come. I'm thanking the audience and uh, well, we have now 
a few more minutes break and we will um, continue at 10.45 with the next session, which will be time in news and on the web. And well, I'm looking for a short coffee break now, uh, unfortunately not in presence, but uh, well, that's all for the moment being. So let's have a 15 minute break and then meet again at 10.45 in this room. See you again. Thank you, see you. Uh, thanks to our host also, um, Abhishek, so everything uh, went perfectly fine. Uh, thanks for supporting us uh, in the session and well, um, have a nice rest of the conference. See Thank you. you. So it's about the time. Uh, let's uh, start the first paper presentation, which is a bi-level assistant assessment of Twitter data for election prediction. Um, please, uh, uh, how, how, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, Sin the house. Siddharth, uh, but I'll do it. I, yeah, yes, but it. please share your video record. Yeah, sure. Just hold on for a moment. OK. Hello, yes, I can I'm Manisi, on behalf of all the co-authors, we'll be discussing a paper titled A Bi-Level Assessment of Twitter Data for Election Prediction, Delhi Assembly Elections 2020. In this work, we have basically uh, used the data from Twitter related to the assembly elections that were held in year 2020 in Delhi, that is the capital of India, and try to see can we relate the uh, uh, that Twitter data with the actual results of the election and for this, we have basically used uh, a bi-level approach where we have assessed with respect to political parties as well as candidates. These are the outlines for my discussion. Uh, first, I will be uh, talking about the background related to the use of Twitter in predicting the results of election. Then I will be stating the problem with which our paper deals with then I will be uh, talking about the, um, the different methodologies we have employed in our study. Uh, then I will be discussing the uh, results of our analysis and comparing it with the actual results of the election. And finally, I will be summarizing our paper. So beginning with the background, uh, there have been studies that uses data from Twitter uh, for predicting the results of elections. Means a lot of work have been done in this regard. Uh, and for this, uh, various parameters have been um, used in different studies in order to identify the winners of the elections, be it with respect to candidate or with respect to political party. One of the attributes uh, uh, that have been used is the number of mentions. That is, more the number of mention for a particular political party in the uh, tweets, then more is the chances of that particular political party being the winner of that elections. Another uh, attribute that have been used is the sentiments. Uh, means more uh, positive sentiments towards the political party or uh, greater uh, share of positive sentiments with respect to negative sentiments have also been associated with the, uh, with the, um, with being the winner of the election for a candidate or a political party. Third uh, parameter that has been associated uh, with the results of the election is the response that a particular candidate receives on Twitter. I mean, there was a study um, um, related to the US midterm elections that were held in year 2010. And it uh, uh, observed that, that a candidate which received more retweets or mentions by their followers on the platform um, were, has more chances of being the winner of the election. Another uh, attribute that have been uh, uh, is the activeness of our candidate. Means, means the activeness uh, of a candidate has been associated with the results of the election. Means it has been found in these studies that, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the results of US uh, elections that were held in 2008 as well as 2012 have been associated with the uh, extensive campaigning that were held 
by the candidate uh, last but not the least uh, the number of followers a candidate has has also been associated with the uh, with the win of that particular candidate in the election so uh, basically uh, our paper tries to find the relation between the actual results of the election and the data that we have from the twitter related to that election and in this regard what we have done is that we have used a bi level approach which involves both the candidates means that is we have uh, assessed with respect to candidates as well as the political parties involved in the election and try to assess the prediction capability of the twitter platform means the data which we have from the twitter platform can we use that data with respect to candidates or political parties to to predict the results of election so the methods that we have used in our study uh, is the first the, the data which we have collected means means the first i will be talking about the, how we have collected the data as said we have used the data from the twitter platform in related to the assembly elections uh, that were held in delhi in the year 2020 Uh, basically in this study we have collected three different data sets first is the uh, uh, we have um, is the tweets which are related to elections which were collected using keywords delhi and election so um, so the first set is the election relevant tweets second is uh, is the candidate related tweet means we have collected the tweets of all the candidates as well as the retweets and replies to those tweets also and this was done using the twitter handle of the candidate and the twitter api the third category of uh, data which we have collected is the uh, tweets related to political parties that were involved in the elections so for this we have collected the tweets tweets of the political parties as well as the retweets and replies to the tweets of those political parties I mean just like candidates we have collected the similar set of data for with respect to the political parties so here we have used the twitter handles of those political parties second is the um, since in the study we would be doing a sort of a sentiment uh, means we will be assessing the role of sentiments in the prediction of the election results so uh, we have basically uh, for this we have used our election relevant tweets that i have discussed earlier so for this uh, we have used the election relevant tweets um, but only those tweets out of them that mentions a single political party in order to find out whether uh, means in order to say that yes particular sentiment is towards that particular party if, if for example if it involves multiple parties then we may not be able to identify um, whether this positive or the negative sentiments are in respect to which part, um, political party so we have so in this regard we have uh, filtered only um, means we have retained only those tweets which mentions only single political party uh, and uh, and we have basically uh, computed the proportion of positive as well as negative sentiments in every tweet and for this we have used a very popular tool known as the uh, liwc tool that is linguistic inquiry and word count tool this is a method which we have used to obtain the positive as well as the negative sentiment um, proportion in a given tweet say suppose we have an election tweet which mentions only a single political party uh, we have uh, used the liwc dictionary and uh, on this tweet and obtained the number of words expressing positive emotions number of words expressing negative emotions and overall words that were present in the tweets means overall count of the words that were present in the tweets using the number of uh, positive means using the number of words expressing positive emotions with respect to the total number of words we have computed the proportion of the positive sentiment in the tweet similarly for the negative sentiment proportion we have basically computed the that ratio of the the words uh, ratio of the number of words that express negative emotion with respect to the overall words that were present in the tweet 
so in this way we opt for every tweet we obtain both the positive sent uh, the proportion of both the positive sentiments as well as the proportion of negative sentiments uh, apart from sentiment we have also extracted the uh, profile attributes of candidates as well as the political parties um for the, uh, and in this regard we have collected two uh, types of attributes uh, one is the long term attributes and another is the short term attributes when we say long term attributes we basically means uh, the overall profile uh, with the overall uh, profile attributes of the uh, candidate or political party and when we say short term by short term we mean uh, uh, we are only focusing on the uh, pre election period that is which we, um, which is 18 days in our case means we have used 18 days and we are only talking about the in the short term we are only talking about attributes that are related to those 18 days so in case of long term attributes we have used basically five uh, uh, attributes that is the number of tweets means of the overall tweets that have been posted by uh, by the uh, twitter account so far the uh, the date when which the account was created that is the age of the account the number of friends and the number of followers of those and and the number of uh, tweets that have been liked by that twitter account all these attributes are referred as the long term attribute that they are the general attributes related to any twitter account the next set of attributes were the short term attributes these attributes were only specific to the or those 18 days period just before the election so these are the the number of retweets by the account the number of tweets and the number of replies uh right in this 18 days period so uh, next i will be discussing about the results of the election so before be, um, discussing the the uh, the results of the analysis which we have done first i would be uh, uh letting uh, means uh, would be discussing the actual results of the uh, means the assembly elections uh, there were three major parties were involved means one was the aam aadmi party um, and and i will be referring it as aap second was the um, bharatiya janata party uh, i will be referring it as bjp for the further discussions and third is the indian national congress and i will be referring it as congress so there were three parties aap bjp and congress and there were total 70 seats in the elections out of those 70 seats 62 seats were won um, were won by aap me by the candidates of aap and the remaining eight seats were won by bjp uh sorry it would be zero that means the the third party that is the congress did not won any seat um, please consider this as zero so we would be uh, so uh, so we would be comparing these actual results with the uh, the result uh, the analysis which we have done in our study for this we have first uh, analyzed the uh, the top 20 hashtags or mentions that were present in the election relevant tweets uh, so these are the hashtags and the mention if you look at the hashtags we could see that they are both that means we would have both uh, neutral hashtags as well as hashtags that were biased towards any um, political party uh but if we focus only on non neutral hashtags uh, then the most frequently occurring hashtag um, was the the hashtag delhi with bjp and as i already discussed uh, bjp was not the winning party of that election so uh, just merely looking at the uh, hashtags would not be a good idea Uh, we also uh, focus on the the mention the number of mentions and the, the top 20 mentions in this uh, what we observe was that the, the top two mentions here mentions means the uh, when a particular when the author of a tweet specifically mentions the twitter handles through uh, directly or indirectly for example through reply or through specially mentioning that twitter handle uh, so if we just compare the the frequency of mentions and the top two mentions uh, were basically belong to means basically belong to the 
one was the arvind kejriwal who was the who is the leader of the winning party that is aap and second is the aam aadmi that is the winning party itself so both these two top two mentions belong to the winning party so one might we might say that uh, that uh, this mention and directly twitter handles suggest the winner of the election and uh, next what we do uh, what we have done is uh, earlier what we did was we have just focused on the uh, the at the rate uh, mentions that were present in the tweet but these are not the only way to mention a particular political party we might just simply write the name of that particular political party without uh, using their twitter handles so uh, next what we did was we did a keyword based uh, uh, means we compared the keyword based political party mentions we did this in two different ways first was that we simply looked for the uh, the overall number of uh, mentions uh, for a um, for a particular political party say bjp aap and congress and second what we did was uh, we used only those tweets that specifically mentioned uh, one political party and how did we obtain these we simply uh, we simply look for the uh, the names of that political party or these abbreviations and what did we observe was that that in both the cases the party which has maximum mentions be in the overall election relevant tweets or be in the election relevant tweet that mentions only single political party uh, in both the cases bjp was that party that has maximum mentions but as we know that the, that uh, it was not the winning party so just looking at the keyword based mention might not be a good idea if we are predicting the results of the election next uh, what we did is we tried to uh, analyze the sentiment towards the political parties so um, we basically since we, uh, we since uh, as discussed in the methodology section we come for every tweet we computed the proportion of positive as well as negative sentiments so uh, so for every political party we just find out the mean proportion of positive as well as negative sentiment and compare it um, with the other parties and what we observe was that be it the be it the positive sentiment or be it the negative sentiment the mean proportion was higher for bjp here also we did not obtain these results for the winning party at least for the positive sentiments we did not observe and uh, next was uh, the uh, we basically did the above analysis in a temporal fashion that is we divided our overall uh, time period of 48 days of data collection which we did um, into uh, several blocks and uh, for example we assess the uh, sentiment for the last three days then we assess for the entire last one week then we assess for the last two weeks then last one month and finally for the last 48 days we basically aim to see whether uh, doing this sort of analysis might help in in uh, associating the uh, twitter data with the actual results and what did we observe was that here also that overall um, there were more positive sentiments for bjp which was not the winning party the interesting observation was that if you just look at the uh, data with respect to the last one week or the last two weeks completely uh, we obtain least negative uh, means we obtain uh, least proportion of negative sentiment for the uh, the winning party here uh, the, the important point to be noticed that that we have only discussed those results that that where we observe significant differences among the proportions apart from sentiments uh, where we have observed that uh, specifically looking at this particular last one week and last two week we obtained the uh, results uh, that were related to the actual results 
but uh, next we focused on the availability of the candidate on twitter is can we associate the uh, the availability of a candidate on twitter with the actual results so what we observed was we did this analysis for all the three parties means all all the candidates were not available on twitter so if you talk about bjp when we say availability we basically means uh, the candidates actually has at least tweeted once for the entire 48 days period of our data collection so in that case uh, only 54% of um, candidates of bjp were uh, available on twitter similarly um, 64% for aap and 33% for congress so basically the number of candidates that were available on twitter was the highest for the winning party that is aap so it might be that being uh, uh, available on twitter uh, helps a particular candidate in winning the election or a particular party in winning the election means the candidates of a particular party next uh, what we did was we now we focus on the activeness of a um, candidate of um, with respect to their political parties on twitter here the activeness we means um, since we have done this analysis for a uh, Uh, means a daily analysis means from the 21st jan to 7th feb here the um, the important point to be noted is that uh, that this is you know um, that we have start although our data collection was a 48 days period but um, but when we when it comes to comparing the uh, the candidates activeness with respect to their political parties we have uh, we have did this analysis uh, for a shorter time period that is of 18 days this is because mm, that 21st jan was the date when all the parties have uh, announced their all the candidates so we have did this analysis uh, from 21st jan to 7th feb 8th feb was the date when the uh, when the actual election happened so uh, for uh, mm, so if we consider the uh, uh, daily activeness on twitter of the candidates what we observe was uh, means uh, what we observe was that the number of tweets per candidate were actually lower for the winning party so uh, this um, suggests that merely uh, being active daily does not ensure uh, win in the election and in an important thing to note here is that we have focused on the number of tweets per candidate and not the number of tweets basically this was done because uh, because as we have seen earlier that that there is a means uh, uh, the percentage of candidates that were available on twitter for all the parties were different so instead of so instead of just comparing the number of tweets which were not be a, which may not be a uh correct way what we did was we just compared the number of tweets per candidate and uh, and from this analysis as uh, as said earlier that the party which won the election uh, were least active if you see in the daily uh, tweeting activeness on twitter by the candidates with respect to those political parties another uh, 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 thing what we did related to activeness on twitter was that we uh, instead of just looking at the daily pattern we look at the three days windows that is we divided our 18 days data into six time periods of three days windows and just look at the activeness of the candidate on twitter here uh, the here the it shows the percentage of the candidates in these bars basically shows for example in this case this bar basically shows uh, the percentage of a candidate that tweeted at least once within this time period so if we look at this analysis what we observe that from the point of view of the winning party that if we focus on the last 6 uh, days is that these two three days period the winning party was least active in that time so uh, just being more active just before the elections may not be a good 
uh, or may not be going to help in winning the elections rather another uh, analysis what we did was we tried to compare the total profiles of the candidates with respect to their political parties so uh, and these uh, as as discussed earlier here we have basically compared uh, long term as well as short term attributes I means there was five long term attributes and the remaining three was the short term attribute and what we observed on comparing the uh, the total profile attributes of the candidate with respect to the political parties was that uh, the we obtained significantly higher number of average followers as well as the average number of replies per tweet for those uh, candidates that belong to the winning party so means uh, having more followers or more replies to the tweet means getting more response per tweet and during the election period could be a good indicator of whether that uh, whether the particular candidate would going to be winning the election or not. this was done with respect to the political party we also did this analysis with respect to the candidates uh, who had won the election versus the candidate who have lost the elections so in this uh, analysis uh, we here also we observe that the having more followers on an average would increase would have more means about the particular candidate have more chance of winning the election so uh, so one thing was common in both these uh, results was that the number of followers might play a key role when it comes to finding out whether that particular candidate would win the election or whether that particular candidate belonging to a particular party would win the election the last analysis what we did was we uh, instead of uh, just comparing the candidate profile attribute we try to compare the uh, profile attributes of the three political parties that is bjp aap and congress on different attributes on different sets of attributes here for just for uh, readability purpose we have scaled certain attributes as mentioned here uh, as we are only interested in comparative analysis so what we uh, could see from this or uh, what we could observe that uh, that be it the number of followers be it the retweets per tweets or the replies per tweets the maxim in in all the cases the party that was dominating it was uh, bjp but this thing could be associated with the fact that here uh, the party which we are talking about uh, that is bjp is a national level party where aap uh, is not a national level party it specifically belongs to delhi delhi if we talk about um, about uh, the time when the election were held it specifically um, is, uh, it is not a national party means aap is not a national party whereas bjp is a national party so we could uh, say that uh, having more dominance in terms of followers or the responses getting for the tweets uh, could be associated with the popularity of that party party so if we summarize the results of our paper as we know twitter has become a very popular platform be it for the political parties or for the candidates when it comes to elections because it provides a medium to uh, to share their political ideas among their voters in this paper we have specifically used a bi level approach that is we have analyzed the results of data obtained from twitter in predicting the results of elections the actual results in the context of both the candidates as well as political parties uh if you talk about the various parameters that we have tested the number of mentions for a political party or the sentiments towards a political party 
we did not find any uh, solid evidence that could help us in predicting the results of election apart from some few observations and uh, if we just uh, talk about the uh, profile attributes of the candidates then the number of followers and the average replies per tweet were dominated in case of winning candidates in this analysis we have used the election data uh, related to india uh, and as we know the percentage of um, indian population may not be as comparable when we talk about other countries where, where like usa where the where twitter data has been extensively used for predicting the results of election but uh, the findings which we have done suggest that since uh, there are a lot of parameters we have analyzed some some were suggesting that uh, uh, suggesting the actual results some were not suggesting the actual results so uh, our study basically uh, highlights the issue that we must uh, uh, in future we must try to do a cross national study where we involve multiple nations and there means the elections of those multiple nations and try to see how twitter could be helpful in predicting the results of those elections that are held in different countries because if you talk about um, from one country to another there are lot of other various factors such as demographics which might play an important role when it comes to predicting the results of elections so uh, so in future uh, we require an analysis uh, that is done over multiple countries uh, involving multiple elections that might help us in answering um, that whether twitter is actually helpful in predicting the results of election thank you thank you so much uh, and thank you manish san for your uh, video record and your presenting uh, uh, at this section so there is nearly no time left for the question and answering uh, let's uh, directly start to the second paper presentation, which is detection of infectious disease outbreaks in search engine time series using non-specific uh, cinematic surveillance with effective flattering. And uh, this paper will be presented by Audit of Ovidia. Please get started when, when you are ready. Yes, thanks. Let me quickly share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Great. So, hey everyone, and uh, thanks for attending. It's really great uh, to be here today. And I'll be presenting a work uh, we've done here at Microsoft. I'm a, a data scientist at Microsoft, and I'm also a PhD student at the Lviv University for the Department of Applied Mathematics. And this specific work was done uh, jointly with uh, Dr. Oren Arisha who's the head of the AI team in the intercity AI and cloud team in, at uh, Microsoft, and Dr. Elad Yomton, who is a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research and also visiting scientist at the Technia. And the title of this work is Detection of Infectious Disease Outbreaks in Search Engine Time Series Using Non-Specific Syndrome Surveillance with Effect Size Filtering. This will be our outline for today. We'll begin with a short introduction about the general history of the field of syndrome surveillance. Then we'll move on to discuss the actual data set and how web-based query data can help us. Uh, then we'll discuss our algorithm and finally we'll see some uh, pretty graphs. Let's begin with the introduction. Public health surveillance in general is the collection, analysis and interpretation of all health-related data. And some examples are, for example, morbidity statistics or, or uh, examining a single disease such as diabetes or sending out uh, questionnaires and surveys for the public health of the general population. And more specifically, syndromic surveillance is uh, using such health related data in order to predict whether we see, we currently see an ongoing uh, pandemic and catch it in a, at a very early stage. And we do it by monitoring general symptoms over time. Now, there are two main uh, types of uh, syndromic surveillance systems, uh, the specific types and the non-specific. And the 
uh, a few differences between the two. So, for example, the specific systems uh, usually detect an outburst of a predefined disease. So, for example, we say flu. So, we'll be monitoring only exclusively flu symptoms. And when we're dealing with a non specific system, we'd like to detect any type of anomaly over time over any symptoms. So, we do not know the symptoms beforehand. As a result, uh, when dealing with a specific system, we have a very low dimensionality. So, for example, flu, we'll be monitoring about five symptoms, say a cough, fever, et cetera. But when we're talking about a non specific system, we we'll want to uh, basically monitor every single symptom we have. So we'll have a very high dimensionality of the data set. And another consequence is that specific systems usually cannot handle novel disease outbreaks, uh, which we saw during the COVID-19 outbreak. And non-specific uh, systems can do that because they do not require any predefined knowledge. And finally, both types of systems can usually incorporate web-based data. This is a brief history of the field of uh, public health surveillance. We start all the way back in the Middle Ages in the Republic of Venice, where it was the first time that government response was taken in order to combat a pandemic during the Black Death. And uh, the Venetian government decreed that all ships must stay at port for 40 days before disembarking. And this is actually where we get the word quarantine from, in quarantine meaning uh, 40 in, in uh, Venetian Italian. And then later in England, in the early modern period, during the Great Plague of London, it was a, a conduction of the first epidemic field investigation, it was the first time records were kept of a daily progression of disease. Uh, later on in the 19th century, also in England, it was the first time there was a statistician that was put in charge of public health uh, surveillance. It was uh, William Farr, some of you here, considered to be the founder of modern surveillance. Then later in the US, uh, it became mandatory to report on the infectious disease uh, statistics. And even later in the 20th century, the CDC was founded originally to combat malaria. And finally, in the 1960s in Geneva, the World Health Assembly declared uh, surveillance to be essential for any department of health in any functioning country. Then later on, finally, in the 1990s, with the advent of uh, the World Wide Web, we gained access to new and different types of the data set for public health surveillance. So where are we now? Uh, originally, I was optimistic. I said post-COVID-19, but we're very much in the middle of the COVID-19. And if there is a single silver lining to a uh, general world epidemic, we get a lot of data about it. And uh, a large part of this data is web-based data. And this allows us, data scientists, statisticians, mathematicians, and general AI practitioners to utilize uh, modern tools and analyze these data sets. So let's talk about data sets. Traditional data sources for syndromic surveillance include emergency, emergency department visits, the data sets from health clinics or private major healthcare providers, and finally some governmental data. And most of these data sets include uh, records of visits to physicians. However, there are several difficulties with such data sets, and uh, throughout this talk, we'll be focusing mostly on the United States. So in the case of the US, about 12% of the US adult population is uninsured, and about 43% have inadequate health coverage. So as a result, a lot of people do not go and see a physician even when they have uh, severe symptoms. So traditional data sources, data sources do not fully represent the population. Also, people that have mild symptoms often just stay at home. If someone has a bit of a cough, they, they could stay at home for uh, three days and that'll be the end of it. Uh, and they wouldn't necessarily go and visit a doctor. And finally, um, many of these data sets are inaccessible to the general public. One solution for this problem is to transform uh, into the future and use the search engine query data from the web. So uh, in a major juxtaposition to the uh, previous slide, 93% of the US adult population use the internet. So we get a much better outreach and even marginalized communities such as the homeless people or prisoners actually have access to the internet while they don't often have access to uh, healthcare. And also people, uh, the same people who stay at home without going to the doctor, often utilize Dr. Google and just search the symptoms online before going to the doctor. 
And finally, uh, due to COVID-19, much of these data sets uh, became publicly available, including uh, Google and Bing. So as a result, we can see that search engine data can possibly give us a more realistic and accurate view of the public health of the entire population. Let's get to the specifics of the Google COVID-19 search trends data set. Uh, researchers at uh, Google uh, created a data set containing uh, search queries over time for over 400 predefined symptoms and medical conditions. And they calculated the scores for each query popular popularity for each symptom. And they aggregated data into weekly and daily granularity going all the way back to November 2017, so even before COVID-19. And they used the locations of Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, Singapore, the UK, and the US. And they further divided the US data into 50 states, which is going to be the data set we are going to cover today. Finally, one disadvantage is the data is aggregating, normalized, and anonymized using differential privacy uh, in order to comply with uh, various uh, privacy and compliance demands. So that means that there is a bit of extra noise added to the data set, which makes the problem more difficult. And here are two examples from the data set going all the way back from uh, December 2018 to uh, June 2021. Here we see uh, two different symptoms. One is an allergic reaction in, in orange, and the second one in blue is anosmia or the loss of the sense of smell. And we see an interesting pattern here. If we were to look at the allergic reaction, we'd see that we have a bit of a spike here around April to June 2019. And then we see a similar spike at uh, April to June uh, 2020. So when we uh, develop a synonymous surveillance system, we wouldn't want to trigger an alarm here at the second one, because we see that it is part of a seasonal trend we would like to capture. So when we see a large amount of allergic reactions in spring, it does make a lot of sense. However, when we look at the anosmia graph, we can see that around early 2020, there is a major spike in, in the search popularity. And we can see that there is no equivalent spike in 2019. And as we all know, at this stage of the pandemic, the loss of the sense of smell is one of the main symptoms of COVID. So we can see that indeed there is a very strong correlation and many people search for this symptom in early 2020. So that's exactly the sort of, uh, of case where we'd want to raise an alarm and notify the authorities. Let's talk about our algorithm and how we do it. We begin here with a problem formulation. I wouldn't get too deep into the mathematical formulation, but uh, all we need to know is that we get a series of historical days where we get an incidence vector for each day, which is a vector containing the, the popularity scores for each symptom at that specific day. And now, given our current day, which we call the inference day, we would like to predict whether there is an ongoing nascent epidemic uh, right now and decide whether or not we would like to raise an alarm. And this is the main flow of the algorithm based uh, mostly on uh, the work done in What's Strange About Recent Events by uh, Wong et al. And we conduct this uh, system for each and every symptom. Sorry, we begin with the uh, inference day data, which is the current day and the popularity scores for each symptom, and we create a baseline data. Soon we'll discuss each and every step in the algorithm in more detail, and you'll get uh, and you'll see how we define the baseline data. Then we can we compare our current inference day to the baseline data and conduct a statistical significance test. If the results are insignificant, everything is okay. We do not raise an alarm. However, if we see a significant increase in the number of cases, we move on to a second test, which is an effect size test. And we repeat the same process. If we do not find the increase to be significant, we don't raise an alarm, otherwise we continue. And finally, we have one last alarm triggering condition, uh, which uh, decides whether or not we would like to raise an alarm. So as you can see over here, we have uh, three uh, levels of tests that all of them need to pass in order to raise an alarm. And we create the uh, baseline data as follows. When we take each day and compare it to the entirety of the historical days, it would be highly inefficient because we'd lose a lot of data. For example, in the allergic reaction case, we saw that uh, there is a seasonality trend. So we'd like to capture that. 
So we want to compare the inference day only to similar days in the baseline period. So we do that by taking the historical uh, period and choosing only days that have uh, the same season and the same day of week as the inference day. But here's my example. Uh, if the inference day is a Sunday during the winter, then our baseline data will be composed of all Sundays during the winter in the historical data. Then we move on to our first test, which is, is a statistical significance uh, test. We create a contingency table of the various symptoms and uh, compare the baseline to the inference and the prevalence of each symptom. So for example, here, if we take the allergy symptom, we can see uh, how many allergy uh, popularity scores we have in the baseline period and how many non-allergy we have. And obviously uh, the amount of other symptoms is much larger. And we can see that the amount of the inference period is also much lower because the inference period is only one day while the baseline period is a large amount of days. And then given this contingency table for each and every symptom, we can calculate its p-value and conduct a statistical significance analysis. So for example, the p-value over here is very small, which is smaller than most alpha uh, chosen. Usually alpha is a 0.05 or slightly lower. And we calculate this p-value using a Fisher's exact test, which we wouldn't get to the, into the combinatorics of it. We'll just say that we were conducting a one-sided test because we're only interested in an increase in the prevalence of symptoms and we do not care about a decrease. Unfortunately, p-values are not enough for big data. When we are losing, using uh, large sample sizes, there's the vanishing p-value problem, where p-values quickly go to zero, regardless if the case is practically significant or not in applications. So as a result, we get a very large amount of false positives. We find that using hypothesis testing exclusively in the world of web data uh, without any, any other addition could lead to practically unusable results. So one solution to this problem is using effect size combined with statistical significance. And the idea of effect size is to sift out uh, practically significant events versus statistically significant events that do not matter in practice. And it's using web data has been shown to be very useful. For example, in the paper, Too Big to Fail, the samples and the p-value problems, it was demonstrated by researchers from eBay on the web data of e-commerce. So throughout this paper, we used uh, Cohen's H in order to calculate the effect size, uh, which is the arc sine square root uh, transformation of the distances between two proportions, where the proportions P1 and P2 in our case are just the ratios between the inference and the baseline of the columns and the rows in our contingency table. And our uh, condition here, when we take uh, this table, we can see that the Cohen's age is 0.0165. And the equivalent to the alpha of the statistical significant test originally proposed by uh, Cohen himself was uh, beta equal to 0.2. Notice here that unlike the statistical significant test and the p-values, we do not look for very small values. We're actually looking for big values. And the larger the values, the, the bigger the impact is. And we see that this table over here, uh, actually Cohen's age is uh, quite a bit smaller than our threshold. So in real life, using our, our algorithm, we wouldn't raise an alarm in, uh, in that case. And it does make a lot of sense because allergy is not the sort of symptom we expect to see in a pandemic. And finally, we have one last uh, condition, which is the alarm trigger condition. And due to the inherent noise in the data set, which we mentioned earlier, we want the model to be robust and uh, to sift out false positives. And we can use some domain knowledge, very simple domain knowledge uh, at that, where we know that disease outbreaks share common symptoms over time. So for example, if we have a flu, we expect to see, uh, for example, cough, fever, cough, fever over time, something like that. So we only raise an alarm when, you observe, when we observe at least one common symptom in the alarm calls for M consecutive days, where M is a tunable hyperparameter, it could be three days, could be five days, and so on. Let's look at our results. Here's the experiment setup. We tested our algorithm on the US data set, 
and uh, from Google, and we only used the 15 most populous uh, states. This was once again due to the uh, differential privacy and the noise where smaller states could not be properly utilized. And as a baseline period, we chose the period from 2017 and 2018. And as an inference period, we chose 2019 onwards. We did that in order to include uh, some COVID and some non-COVID elements in the inference period. And uh, to see the difference in results, we went ahead and split the, the inference period into a pre-COVID phase and a mid-COVID phase. For the pre-COVID case, uh, the model raised uh, 40 different alarms, uh, 33, four of which could be attributed to specific medical conditions. And furthermore, 19 alarms were judged to be caused by uh, media sensation and news coverage of health-related events. And these events were very easy to filter out using uh, Google News on the specific dates, since we know the exact date of the alarm trigger. And then after filtering out these events, we managed to uh, capture four different uh, epidemics. The first one was a uh, hepatitis A outbreak in Florida. And we raised an alarm around April and May 2019, while the state of Florida declared a national emergency uh, during August, a bit later. Then we also managed to, to catch the e-cigarette or vaping use associated lung injury, or for short, for short e valley which was a nationwide outbreak in 2019. We raised an alarm all the way back in June, while the CDC declared an emergency and began, only began monitoring cases around August. So it was, uh, once again, about two months earlier. And here, in the case of measles, there was a very small measles outbreak in uh, Clark County, Washington. And in this case, our model is slightly struggled. The measles outbreak uh, began around January, while our model raised an alarm around March, which corresponds roughly to a, a second wave of the measles outbreak. And we theorize that because of the very limited uh, geographic uh, uh, scope and very low number of cases, our model struggled a bit. But then we see in the case of the Eastern Equine Encephalitis or the AAA virus, uh, it was surprising that we managed to, to catch it because it was a very small uh, outburst, but it was uh, very widely spread across the United States. Uh, however, we noticed that the longest alarms were raised around uh, Massachusetts and Michigan, which were the states that were most affected by the outbreak according to the CDC. So it makes a lot of sense. And here is, uh, uh, just remind you again, how the algorithm looks like. And let's see how it functions for COVID-19. Here we have a graph showing in orange, normalized number of uh, cases. Uh, th th this is in the, in the United States uh, over time in orange. In green, we can see the popularity scores for queries relating to anosmia. In red, we can see the popularity scores relating to low grade fever and in blue, we can see where there is an alarm, where one means an alarm and zero means no alarm. And we can see that here uh, at the early part of uh, 2020, around March, we raised an alarm for low grade fever and the alarm went on. I managed to capture basically most of the first wave of COVID up to the decline. And then once again, later that year, at the beginning of the second wave, we managed to raise another alarm and this time uh, stemming from anosmia. And here are a few more general results uh, on uh, New York State. And we can see that we can modify uh, coins age threshold based on the desired sensitivity. So it's a bit of a feature for decision makers to use depending on the desired, uh, the desired sensitivity for false positives. And we can see that when we use uh, a coins age threshold of uh, zero, basically we get constant alerts whether or not there is any reason to raise an alarm or not. But by increasing coins age, we can see a nice convergence into the major uh, waves of the pandemic. However, uh, the, uh, the lower the threshold we choose, the earlier we can raise an alarm. So there's a bit of trade-off over there. And finally, in terms of explainability, which is a very important part of every model, especially in the field of public health surveillance, since we need to explain the model's alerts, 
we can see that we have a pro progression over four waves of COVID that we tested in New York again. And we see that in the first wave, the symptoms that uh, uh, were more important and raised the, the most alarms were mostly fever related and uh, breath related. While in the later stages of the pandemic during the third and fourth wave, we can see that the most impactful uh, features or symptoms were anosmia, agusia, or dysgeusia, which are all the loss of either smell or taste. So we can see that as the, the pandemic went on, there were different between uh, various trends of COVID and also people became more aware of symptoms such as anosmia, which were not known early in the pandemic. And finally, for some future work, we would like to test the algorithm on medical data as well and uh, see um, how it works in a compared to web data. We would like to employ it and deploy it in a real world production scenario. And at last, uh, possibly help decision makers and try to make the world a better and safer place. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Odi. Uh, thank you for your interesting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, we have around four minutes for the question and the answering. Uh, so please, uh, Mark, unmute yourself and answer your question uh, and ask your question. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation, um, Odi. So this was quite uh, very interesting. Um, let me just uh, get a bit of an idea as you mentioned about specific medical conditions which uh, actually also might cause uh, false alarms if you wish so what kind of um, uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of specific medical questions uh, or conditions could this be just give me a brief idea what uh, what causes these alarms uh, or false alarms yeah sure uh, thanks for the question and uh, uh, thanks for inviting me here uh, that's a very good question, and we didn't see any specific pattern in terms of uh, false positives. It wasn't really any specific, say, uh, coughing or fever that caused the, the false positives. Uh, it was actually due to the noise induced in the data set. And the noise was sampled from a Gaussian random distribution. So there wasn't any uh, significant pattern over there. Okay, but uh, but still, in terms of quantity, I mean, it means uh, there is a, a certain amount of well, I know there's white noise if you wish, but uh, I mean, it it needs to reach a certain threshold, right? I mean, uh, it's not uh, coming, uh, it's not coming from one or uh, a single or two or three isolated questions, right? I mean, it must be something like uh, a significant amount of uh, queries, right? Uh, yes, because the, the numbers were very large. As you saw, the numbers were in terms of millions. And when you deal with such a large sample size, often uh, a very little amount of noise could be considered significant when using hypothesis testing. Yeah. I see. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's cool. And the last question here. Did you also consider when uh, checking the timestamps. I mean, did you also check the uh, G, uh, did you also manage to check the geolocation where actually things uh, come from in order to uh, to see a bit better uh, if there is a, a, a also a, a regional cluster? Uh, that would be a very fascinating work for a future project, but uh, unfortunately, we use the statewide data set. So when we use it uh, statewide, it was a bit difficult to find the geolocation. I see. We could theoretically use a more a granular data set in the future to find locations in different counties within the state. Uh, uh, uh. Because this might be also helpful to see whether it comes from a mobile device or from a from a from a laptop or whatever, right? I mean, or uh, also to see uh, ideally uh, which which part of the country it comes from in order to even better detect uh, if there is a kind of a, a new cluster. Yeah, let's see emerging. Uh. Okay, thanks again for this very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, if there is no other questions, uh, it's about uh, the time. So uh, let's welcome the third presenter, Adam Yahoit. Uh, the paper title will be Why Round Years Are Special? Analyzing time references in news articles collections. So, 
Uh, feel free to get started when you are ready. Thank you, Liron. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. And you can see the slides, I hope. Yes, okay. it looks perfect. Okay. Um, thank you. So, um, yeah, welcome again. Um, now I will present my paper, um, which was written together with Antoine Tesset and Ricardo Campos. Title is uh, Diachronic Analysis of Time References in News Articles. Um, so what's the background? Um, temporal expressions, which are embedded in text, right, uh, are very important um, because they indicate temporality of text, but also provide some semantic signals in a sea of unstructured textual data. And actually, many researchers in NLP and information retrieval utilize temporal expressions. Um, expressions like 2004, for example, or tomorrow, yesterday, two days later, and so on. We have many of them, and <coughs> they have been found, I'm sorry, <coughs> useful in the tasks like timeline summarization, in um, information retrieval, or rather temporal information retrieval, which is a subset or subdomain of, of information retrieval in question answering, as we have seen also um, today, uh, earlier in name entity recognition more recently and, and uh, in many other researches. Um, besides that, uh, a large portion of web queries contain temporal expressions. Um, this was already started around 2008 um, that um, some numbers like 2%, but later revised to about 10% of queries contain either explicit or implicit temporal expression. So quite a significant fraction of, of web queries are somehow um, providing us temporal signal. You can see examples here in the last line, like uh, Olympics 2004, Los Angeles Times newspaper, April 1946. These are just actual queries collected uh, from a query log. So, um, so basically, this all gives rise to our uh, motivation that uh, we should study temporal expressions uh, in text because they are frequently used in NLP, in IR, and also often happen in, in uh, uh, web search queries. And they provide important signals about how to position events um, on the time, uh, whether they are expectations of future events or rather remembrances of the past events and so on and so on. So that's why we uh, we decided to to study more in detail um, temporal expressions in actually in news articles uh, in this research. And one more objective is that uh, there is a, a body of, of research called um, collective memory study, which is a part of, um, well, it sits between sociology and, and history. And it studies how people remember the past. Um, so which years they remember, which events, which persons in the past are recalled, and of course, in what way they are recalled. And collective memory, of course, in the past, it was done in a manual fashion by some kind of uh, subject interrogations. But um, increasingly, more and more uh, computing techniques are being applied over large uh, bodies of text to understand how society remembers the past, which years, which events, and so on in particular. So we think that if we provide more information about distributions of um, temporal expressions, uh, about their semantics and so on, we could also inform this kind of collective memory studies, uh, which are um, recently um, strongly quantitative in their nature. And one example of such study you can see here, this is actually from our um, paper published uh, four years ago, we studied how people remember the past in tweets. So what kind of years are frequently mentioned in, in history related tweets? And you can see here, for example, the end of the Second World War um, is, is having a peak here. Quite many tweets uh, mentioned that year, uh, 1916 also, because we collected data in 2016. So there was like a 100 years anniversary of some events in 1916, probably First World War events. And uh, I guess 4 to 1 was for Pearl Harbor and so on. Anyway, um, this kind of time expressions embedded in text is a way to, to see how people remember the past. This is some kind of a past reference uh, next to names of uh, historical persons or names of events. And studying them is equally important also for collective memory studies, not only for NLP and IR, but also for this um, domain as well. 
Uh, so objective of our research is, uh, is, is actually two of them um, in the view of this background that I just gave you. The first um, objective is to provide analysis approach for, for studying this kind of temporal expressions and actually studying their interplay uh, between uh, publication dates in the documents this expression occurred and between themselves and, and their semantics. Um, and we propose different types of analysis here in, in this pipeline, frequency, semantic, and time-based analysis. So first is a kind of pipeline approach that we propose here, for example, to inform collective memory studies. And a second objective is to actually show the results of, of applying this kind of framework on uh, New York Times corpus. And this corpus is uh, is longer than the one which I introduced today uh, in the morning, I mean early morning, uh, because it spans 33 years. Um, I will describe uh, the results very soon. Uh, but before that, I want to um, just also refer to the previous research that we have done, uh, which is closely related to, to the current research. And however, it was lacking in several aspects, and that's why we decided to uh, complement it and continue further this analysis. So this one was uh, done in 2011, where we uh, collected uh, news articles about certain countries. You could see European countries on the top and Asian countries in the middle uh, figure. So each country had about, I don't exactly remember, but close to close to a million or, or half a million news articles about that country. And then from this data, because it was recent data, 20 years long recent data, we extracted all the temporal expressions which were falling into 19 to 1990 and just map them uh, on, on the timeline, as you can see here, which uh, portrays how, how the different years are remembered over time um, for each of the country, European countries and, and Asia, Asian countries. And you can see that some peaks uh, for certain countries are um, appearing, which means that certain year, like perhaps 1933 for, for Germany, is frequently remembered compared to perhaps other year, um, okay, for, for Poland, for example, 1939. But uh, this, is, this is more like a country-to-country -country comparison, but if we combine all the data together in the last plot, you see that we have this kind of forgetting curve, as we call it, which means uh, how we forget the distant past and how we remember the recent past. It's sort of having exponential shape, of course, with certain fluctuations because of the important events. So we already at that time uh, analyzed on, on the a large collection of news because altogether there were several million of news articles. Uh, we analyze how, how these dates are recalled, how basically they are mentioned in text, how often, and that means how we as a society remember uh, certain years and um, how this forgetting also takes shape. But at that time, we didn't study anything about uh, future. It was just the past years. But of course, in news, you have a lot of uh, future expectations, plans and, and deadlines and so on, which we could also map in the same way. Plus, we didn't study at, at that time relation to publication date of uh, documents containing these um, temporal expressions. We just combine all of them together into one bug and visualize like this. Um, and in the next research, which was uh, one year later, we, we looked into um, granularity of temporal uh, expressions um, depending on their um, reference point uh, on the timeline if, if we count from the publication date. So what you can see here in these two plots, the axis um, X indicates the difference between temporal expression when it points to and the publication date of the document containing that temporal expression. So let's say minus one would be all the temporal expressions which point to a year before, right? Minus two, two years, and plus one, plus two in the future. And you can see in the in the bottom graph that um, yearly granularity expressions are widely distributed over this uh, axis X um, line, but the daily granularity is just focused on zero. That means uh, news articles contain um, very specific uh, dates, uh, which contain also day information, but these are only for very uh, close um, time horizon, like, like the same months or the same week. We rarely mention something, let's say, five years later, 
uh, using daily granularity. So mentioning also which particular day was it, right? We rather, when we refer to, to the distant past or distant future, we rather use only years, um, sometimes months, but less and, and definitely not days. So we also studied this thing. And you can see this is already a relation between temporal expression when it points to ended publication date. That, that, that's why you have this minus and, and plus uh, values on the axis X. But only we studied this aspect and there are many other left aspects which are uh, basically research in the current work. So in this work, we used several techniques. Uh, first of all, we did statistical analysis of temporal expressions, but also later we um, we formulated a graph um, based on entities detected from news articles. And then we learned uh, graph-based embeddings, applying also ideas from temporal embeddings to uh, visualize how similar are different years. Um, maybe, for example, year 1938 is similar to 1939 because we remember it in a similar way. Uh, we will see this later um, in one of the graphs. And then finally, we apply also AP clustering. So as you can see, this is a range of techniques here applied for um, uh, for, for providing analysis pipeline um, to study temporal expressions and also uncovering some results. And so let me now talk about the data set and soon later I will um, talk about uh, results uh, based on this data set. Um, and, and also, of course, um, provide more details on the methods. So um, the data set is New York Times, um, but it's not the same one which I described uh, in the early morning because now we crawled uh, the news articles from uh, API and we extended it. So it's not 20 years as before, but it's now 33 years. And we have 282 um, news articles. We extracted name entities from this using Stanford NLP toolkit. And name entities, which is very important for us, contain also year information. So one of type of name entities are years, uh, and other types are persons, locations, and organizations. We used some um, threshold for the occurrence because we had too many unique uh, entities. Um, so we retained 20,000 unique entities. And then what is our focus uh, are the, the content years. So basically all the years, um, the expressions which, which refer to the years um, uh, from 19 to 2020. So it's a 120 years long uh, time period. We studied them um, and we used other name entities like dispersions, locations, organizations as the way to, to represent semantic of years. I will talk about um, graph-based embeddings uh, soon after. Um, but first, let's look at the um, statistical analysis. So uh, here we we show all the uh, all the content years because we we we, we call this this uh, temporal expressions embedded in in the text as content years and we only focus on years where we discarded all the months or the information just too much uh, to care about so only focus on years and we studied how they are uh, distributed in our data set uh, time span on the axis x you see 1980 actually 1983, the data set started to uh, 2013. So we studied uh, how this yearly uh, expressions, yearly granularity content expressions, how they are distributed and we group them into the decades. So different color indicates different decades. And so what we can see that this very old distant past, uh, I should say decades like 90s or 1910s are here at the bottom. And they are rather uniformly distributed over the time span of our data set, um, which, which is 33 years, um, by the way. Uh, but if we look at other decades like 1970s, 80s, 90s, you see these big uh, fluctuations here. Um, and of course, they are much more prevalent um, in our um, data set because the data set contains these uh, this content years, uh, covers them. Right, so content years from 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s, the four decades which are covered by our data set are the most common. Of course, this was um, sort of obvious, but um, it's always good to show it um, from a data and see exactly to what extent um, they appear. And what we see is that the older the decade, the less remembered it is, which is supporting our prior observation from, from 2010, which I showed before. 
And uh, as I also said, uh, the dimension frequency of the distant past days is relatively uniform, but on the more recent uh, decades, we see many uh, fluctuations. So that was one, uh, one visualization of data that we did. Another one is uh, shown here in this slide. Uh, on the axis X, we have uh, frequency of content years, and on the axis Y, we have so-called coefficient of variation which is nothing else but standard deviation based on 33 years um, that, the, that our data set covers, uh, divided by the mean. is just a way to, to compare standard deviations in a fair way. And we didn't uh, show all the years here because there would be too much um, cluttered digits here shown. So we just indicated the last uh, digit and also the color, but but you can still refer using the color and the last digit to to a particular year, which which the point uh, relates to. And what we can see here is that all these zeros, as you can see at the bottom, these are the round dates like 1990, uh, 1980, uh, 2000, um, 2010, and so on. They have the lowest uh, variation, so lowest uh, normalized standard deviation, but they are also frequent in the data set fairly common that's why they are more on the right hand side and we also see that um, the blue color the, the violet color and the purple color which correspond to um, more recent decades are, are having highest variation so um, they are very uh, changing their well they change their frequency quite much when we move from one year to another along the data, data set time span so uh, the, the, not only the frequency is high, but also the change is high, which can be now uh, seen in this uh, graph plot. Uh, we also studied the number of co-carrying uh, unique name entities, uh, which are locations, persons, and, or, or, and organizations. And here you can see that um, there is some relation in the plot, linear relation between this number of co-carrying unique entities uh, with particular years and their frequency. So the more frequent the year, the more co-carrying entities it has. This is also intuitive, but we see that these round days, zeros basically are on the top. So they also co-care with largest number of um, name entities and a more recent uh, decades. So 70s, 80s and upwards are shown on the right-hand side um, top um, portion of the graph. So, so they, they have a large number of co and also these dates are frequent. Um, and uh, the next uh, analysis, what we did is based on, on semantics of years. So we try to build a vector for each year to basically reason about its, um, well, let's say meaning or semantics in what way the year is referred to in, in the news how is it remembered um, we used uh, for this basically name entities so you can see we build a graph like on the right hand side where the blue notes indicate name entities like persons locations organizations and the red notes are also name entities but these are our content years uh, 120 of them and we use a node to vec um, approach, which is building embedding uh, for, for each node. In our case, we only cared about the, the year nodes uh, based, of course, on the connections and, and the, the, the weight of uh, edges here with other name entities. So this is like an embedding representation of um, our target nodes, uh, which are years. And um, it's it's based on how they co-occur with name entities, to what extent. So we have this kind of vectors, and then we could um, visualize these vectors on one two-dimensional um, plane, a plane which I which I will show in the next graph. Just one more thing I want to mention that we have too many edges in uh, here still, so we drop some edges that are not frequent. Uh, they are less than fifteen times in data set. And the edge, um, this was maybe not clearly indicated, but the edge represents the, the co-occurrence between a name entity or name entity or name entity to the year or also year to year. So this is just um, point-wise uh, mutual uh, information uh, as a measure of co-occurrence between uh, different entities. And here you can see um, 
positioning of uh, these embeddings for all the years that, that we started, 120 years, uh, positioning into one uh, two-dimensional plane um, used by, I, I mean, uh, done by TSNE, which is a simple way, well, not simple, but very commonly used, at least a way of uh, visualizing uh, embeddings. Um, the closer they are, the most similar vectors should be. And what we can see here is that the past is sitting here on the left um, bottom hand side, and uh, there is a fairly large distance between different years. So these years are rather remembered, or more more precisely, they are co-occurring with different name entities um, than more recent years, uh, which are more compact to each other. So there is a big spatial distribution here uh, for for the uh, for the distant past years and the more closer we go to the current date you see there is this um, more narrowing happening and uh, the close dates are usually chronologically close uh, dates so for example vector 2006 is close to 2007 and 2005 but farther from 2003 2000 and so on so chronology and uh, semantics are somehow related the, the closer we go to the to the present and to the future. The future actually sits here on the top, which is kind of different from other years because you refer in a different way to the future. And um, yeah, future is uncertain, obviously. We perhaps don't have also much data for these years. Um, so then uh, we, we went uh, farther. Um, Instead of just making one representation for entire data set, we divided data set into four pieces. You can see four sub parts of data set, each one corresponding to one decade. So we have a decade 1980s on the uh, top left, then 1990s, then 2000 and 2010. And we built each such graph, coherence graph from each subset of the data, four subsets. Um, then we calculated node vec embeddings. But we did, um, did did it in a temporal fashion. So once these embeddings were calculated, their uh, vectors were used for initializing calculation of the next uh, embedding. So this was done by a retraining fashion like this, like commonly is done for um, building temporal embeddings. Uh, but still, we could obtain vectors for each decade, vectors corresponding to, to our years. And then we could compare them, um, how different, um, how, how, may, may, maybe how the same year is represented in different decade. This one, uh, this analysis could be uh, performed um, through such a, a study. In total, we had 40, 480 vectors because we have 120 content years, but each year is now represented in each decade. So let's say year, let's say 90s in, uh, 1980s decade and then the same year 90s in 1990s decade and so on so for each year we have four vectors depending what um, subset of the data we used for um, uh, representation and um, what we did with it is uh, we, with this kind of vectors we did a clustering so um, basically these 480 vectors we Put as an input to clustering um, algorithm. We didn't know what should be the number of clusters, so something like k-means uh, was out of the question. We wanted to rather apply clustering that is uh, automatically finding the number of uh, clusters, the, the k, like in the k-means, and we use for this affinity propagation, uh, just inputting all the set of vectors. Uh, affinity propagation decided that the best setting is 51 clusters, and that's what we obtained. So all the uh, 480 vectors were clustered into 51 uh, groups. And then we visualize them like you can see here. Um, the cluster number is indicated in each um, circle, uh, sorry, not a circle, cell. And um, also the, the color indicates uh, the cluster. So it's visually easy to see how the clusters are positioned. And each year, like for example, 90s that I mentioned before, uh, is represented by uh, one of the four um, subset of the data set. So 1980s documents, documents from 1990s, 2000 and 2010s. And now we can see how this year 
is, is distributed among clusters. So for example, you can see it is in cluster four. Um, uh, the first two uh, vectors of this year are in the same cluster, and then the remaining two vectors, uh, 19 and 19, are in another cluster. What we can see from this clustering approach is that um, basically every year is um, belonging or, or yeah, positioned in different clusters. So uh, only year 1953, uh, which is, uh, let me see what it is. Yeah, here somewhere at the bottom is belonging to one cluster. That means that even though we have the same year, but it is, um, uh, it, it, its vector is built on a different subset of, of our data set, then there is a big difference in the semantics. Uh, this year will be positioned in a different clusters. So that means that the same year can be remembered or seen uh, differently in different portions of our data set. And roughly 30% of content years have uh, each of the representation positioned in different uh, clusters. So that was um, another observation, which means um, the way we remember or the way we perhaps um, predict uh, the years depends on, on what uh, documents you use, on, on which um, time frame of documents you, you utilize. Uh, so there are more observations, which I didn't describe here in the, in the presentation, but they are in the paper, uh, which you can check if you are interested. I summarize um, some of them here in this slide. So what we found is that time expressions, um, which are in a temporal news collection, like the, the four decades long time collection that, that we have, um, uh, have certain characteristics such that those which fall into the um, time period of the collection are most common. They have higher um, also fluctuations and then they co-occur with larger number of entities. Uh, then also the, the other observation is the chronological order plays a strong role here in the similarities between years. So if the years are uh, positioned close to each other um, chronologically, they should be more similar than uh, in the case when they are far apart uh, chronologically from each other. Uh, also, the same year has different semantics in different temporal slices of the data set, as was shown in the last uh, visualization. And we also found that round dates uh, like 1990 or 1980 are the most common, and they are subject of less variance than other dates. And also these um, results are rather detailed. We still think they could be applied in uh, some NLP applications. Uh, first of all, they could be applied in collective memory studies when a uh, historian, for example, would, would like to see uh, different frequencies with which uh, the past is uh, remembered. So different years, how they are remembered uh, in, in also what kind of semantics is associated to, to remembering uh, different years. So all this framework could be utilized for that purpose of collecting memory studies. But uh, as I also mentioned in NLP, we could use, it, uh, we could use these findings for uh, normalizing frequencies of temporal expressions. For example, when we estimate uh, importance of a given year, um, how, how important it is in a data set, we should consider if this year falls into the data set or, or is rather outside of the data set, how far it is from the border, left or right border of the data set, because then different normalization needs to be applied. If we see um, uh, past distant year, which is very frequently mentioned uh, in the data set, it may mean it is very important because um, it is expected to, to rather have a low frequency uh, because it just it's far away. Um, but um, yeah, it, it may be mentioned quite frequently, which uh, leads to, uh, to its perceived importance. And also uh, for question answering uh, systems like the one I show uh, in the morning, and some of them may use such temporal expressions. And again, these uh, relations here uh, may be utilized for, for better selection of, of an answer. Uh, using um, found temporal expressions. Finally, similarity between years um, is also um, something that that people use, for example, in timeline um, summarization, in event-to-event -event linking. 
And the similarities that we show uh, uh, in, uh, here in, in, in the previous slides could be, um, could be utilized for, um, for better assessing if two years are similar or if two events happening in these years are similar or not, depending on the distances between them. So overall, we provide some kind of a reference background um, which could be utilized for, for normalization or for a just reference how to understand um, any certain quantities from a, from a data set. Um, so this brings me to the last slide. Um, uh, in, the, in conclusions, what we propose uh, in this uh, paper is an analysis pipeline to study distribution, uh, semantics, and temporal aspects of a time of temporal expressions in, in news collections uh, or archival collections. And second, we also show uh, particular results um, which were obtained from New York Times uh, dataset analysis. In the future, what we want to do is to look at uh, finer, gran finer granularity of temporal expressions, not just care about years, but perhaps year and months or even, even days. Consider also implicit temporal expressions, which are not specified or relative, uh, but nevertheless are still frequent uh, in, in news articles. And then build year embeddings, not just based on name entities like we did here, but based on any text uh, which is surrounding them. So um, build a proper uh, embeddings like using word to vag or bird and so on. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Adam. And uh, unfortunately, we have nearly no time left for question and answering. And uh, Sorry for extending. And uh, so I suppose this is the end of this uh, time web section. And thank you for all your participation. And uh, our next uh, session will be held on 2 p.m., uh, which is in SETO time zone. And uh, hope, uh, looking forward to see you guys again. Thank you. So let's start with the first one. I think Aniket, you are the, the first presenter, right? Could you share your slides? Yeah. Um, no, no. We see Omar Alonso's slides here now. Okay, Aniket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see now. Um, yeah. Good. Um, Should I start? Well, Yes, yes, please, please start. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Anika Tagarwal. Uh, this work was done at Adobe India Research uh, along with my peers, uh, Saurav Suman and Nikhil Sharon, and my mentor, Gaurav Sanha. Uh, so, in today's era uh, of big data, uh, companies are storing huge amount of customer data uh, coming as interactions known as touch points. So these interactions take place through uh, a medium called channels. Some examples can be uh, site searches, ads, or campaigns. Uh, marketing automation softwares enable these businesses to uh, track these touch points in real time, which can be further stitched uh, to form a complete customer journey. This, this softwares uh, further segment the customer journey into multiple stages on the basis of the interaction level with the customer. Uh, so let's see uh, an example for a B2B customer journey. Um, Various marketing automation softwares may have different representation for uh, stage transitions. For our data set, we had these four stages. Uh, so suppose a transition is occurring between company A and company B. So company A may be uh, make, uh, made aware of the product through a campaign or advertisement from company B. Then company A may uh, get a viral email or click on a link to give out the identifying features like name or email address to company B. So this transition would be known as customer known. Uh, we can say that company A is converted into a prospect. So when this prospect shows interest uh, in the buyer company by visiting sites or filling out forms, uh, they get converted into leads. Uh, this transition is called lead creation. Now these leads may land on seller's page, uh, perform some online registration or contact seller representative. When they show concrete interest in uh, buying or purchasing, uh, they get converted into opportunity creation. Now, finally, a decision is made on purchase uh, using a call, various channels like call center, direct mail, or maybe in person. 
so this transition is called journey closed uh, so a customer journey may be called completed uh, if the customer has visited some or all of the stages and a decision is also known so given a b2b customer journey we would like to perform multi touch attribution problem the problem uh, refers to identifying the important interactions or touch points uh, that significantly contributed towards the conversion we would also like to find out the channels uh, that significantly contributed and enable businesses to strategically allocate their budget to various channels uh, this may help uh, the companies improve their return on investments an extension to this mta problem uh, would be also to give attributes to different stage transitions uh, if uh, we could give attribution to different stage transitions businesses would be uh, and also find out which channel or touch point uh, was important for the particular stage transition business would be able to better prior, uh, better prioritize which channel should be uh, given to the customer in an ongoing customer journey so coming to a problem statement uh, given a sequence of completed customer journey along with the time stamps and their eventual conversion label we would like to attribute the credit of eventual conversion to each stage transition the touch points and the channels and we would like to further determine which touch point or channel were important for a given stage transition so let's discuss few challenges uh, unlike a b2c journey b2b journeys uh, span over very long periods sometimes even spanning over an year depending on the type of business the company operates in uh, when we deal in such long time periods uh, we may see some irregular time gaps between the touch points this poses a challenge for uh, b2b models as uh, a touch point that is occurring towards a later stage like journey close stage may have lost context for a for an initial uh, occurring touch point Uh, unlike a B2C journey, like buying a product from Amazon, uh, that may be a simple uh, process, but B2B generally involves many complex decisions, leading to a long-term sequential dependency. Uh, many non-sequential models fail to capture this dependency, uh, but also few sequential models like RNN, they fail in this aspect uh, due to the problem of exploring and vanishing gradients. Lastly, uh, we do not have a quant quantitative uh, analysis for the given attributions. Is we would like to define a matrix where we could compare uh, the attributions of two B2B multi-touch attribution models. So we'll discuss a few prior works. Uh, so first we have uh, the, the simplest set of models as rule-based models. A few example would be a first touch or a last touch model that gives attribution to only a single touch point in the journey. Uh, an extension would be a, a linear model or a W or U-shaped models that uh, gives credit to the uh, touch points. uh using some predefined rules uh we also have a time decay model that is built over a linear model that redistributes the attributes of conversion uh based on the recency of the touch points uh there are many papers that have also tried a data driven approach uh recently we saw a bagged logistic regression model uh, for conversion that uses its model weights as attributes we also have the survival analysis based model for the mta problem Uh, both of these models fail to capture the sequential dependency problem and they also ignore uh, about the irregular time gaps between the touch points lastly we also have some rnn based models uh, there are two examples first would be an arnn model that has an attention layer over a uh, uh, rnn model and these attentions are used as the attributions and secondly we have a shapely value based method that is a cooperative game theory uh, based method that is built over an rnn uh, and which and is used to give attributions so although these rnn models are able to capture uh, some of the sequential dependency but uh, they have very limited uh, reach uh, in the time expect and when uh, this rnns are applied over very long time periods uh, they again face the problem of this uh, vanishing or exploding gradients and this greatly hampers the performance so uh, let's dive uh, this brief sketch of our solution approach Uh, so let let the input to the model be a sequence of customer touch points x1 x2 to xn and an eventual conversion label y2 which denotes whether a conversion happened or not so given this input sequence uh, we would like to model a y prediction uh, using an f model and uh, using the weights of this f model and a y prediction we would like to make a function a uh, model a function attr that would give out the stage transition uh, attributions Uh, AI. 
and using this AI, we would further like to calculate the stage, uh, the touch point attributions and the channel attributions given as A touch and A channel. So we'll talk a bit about our uh, data model. Oh, one second. Yeah, uh, so, so uh, we have a large number of journeys in our data set. Uh, for one such journey, the snippet is shown here in the table. So given we have R stages in our uh, data, the first line may contain R plus one numbers. Uh, the first R numbers represents the number of touch points occurring before the ith stage transition. And the last number Y is the eventual uh, prediction label, conversion label. Uh, since we assume that no touch point is occurring after the last stage transition, the, this number NR will also represent the uh, length of the journey. Now following NR lines, uh, each represent a touch point XI in X1 to XNR. So uh, in this example, the first three columns are numerical features uh, representing uh, timestamp related features and the frequency features. And the last one is a channel ID feature, which is a categorical uh, feature. Uh, but suppose if we had P numerical and Q categorical features, each touch point XI would belong to R is to P into N raised to Q. Uh, moving forward. Uh, so this is the overall architecture of our model. Uh, as we can see, each stage is modeled as a separate uh, sub-network or component um, S1, S2 to SR, where R was a number of stages. And uh, since uh, we assume that any touch point occurring after a particular stage transition will not have any effect on the current or previous stage, the input for each uh, stage or sub-network would be X1, X2 to XNI where NI was a number of touch points before uh, the stage transition. And the output for each sub-network would be YI. Uh, we would apply a concatenation layer over these uh, vectors of YIs, uh, which each of which is a, a vector of size two to get a final vector of size two R. Uh, post that we apply a final dense layer to get a Y out a vector of size two given as Y out zero and Y out one. And finally we apply a softmax to get a Y prediction. Y prediction uh, is a formula can be seen here. So let's dive now inside each of the subnetwork SI. So this SI can be uh, modeled as a layered uh, temporal convolutional networks, TCNs. Uh, suppose we, if we have the input dimension of TCN to be uh, MI, then uh, we uh, do some pre-processing on the input X1 to XNI. Uh, suppose if MI is greater than uh, NI, we pad the input sequence from the beginning to make the length equals to MI. Uh, or if MI is less than NI, then we would uh, truncate the sequence from the beginning uh, for the same reason. Let the input be ZI1, ZI2 to ZI MI. Post that we uh, apply an embedding layer of size E for all the categorical features uh, in the input. So uh, recalling that our input uh, XI belong to uh, R raised to N, uh, R raised to P, N raised to Q. So now it will belong to uh, R raised to P plus EQ after the embedding layer. So given that we have L uh, as a number of uh, hidden layers, uh, we will have L different TCN blocks. Now coming to each TCN block, uh, each TCN block may have multiple dilated convolutional layers with a dilation factor of D, which is equal to two raised to L for the Lth layer in the TCN blocks. Uh, this is an example of a general TCN model uh, where dilation factor is increasing with the increase uh, increasing exponentially with the number of layers so this is uh, to show that a receptive field of tcn uh, becomes very large as we increase the number of layers this helps us to deal with the problem of uh, vanishing gradients and also this can very effectively capture the sequential dependencies between two touch points that occur very uh, far apart in the time expect Uh, so let uh, this uh, stacks of TCN blocks be FTCN. So input was uh, ZI1 to ZIMI and let the output be YI1 to YIMI. So after uh, this uh, output of FTCN, we would slice the uh, uh, just YIMI and apply linear layers over the uh, output. So this YIMI, uh, given the filter size is D, will belongs to uh, R raised to D, Y1 to YD. And applying two linear layers of weights V and W, we will get this vector of size two. And applying a ReLU layer, uh, we will get the final output. The equation can be seen here. 
so coming back to the overall model, uh, we got the y outs as a function of uh, stage outputs, uh, a nonlinear function of stage outputs, and uh, having the y true, uh, we used sparse softmax cross entropy function to uh, calculate the loss, the formula which can be seen here. This was the overall architecture of our uh, stage TCN model. Now we'll come to explaining the model to uh, find the input relevances uh, for the final conversion output and term the input relevances as the attribution. So we adapted layer-wise relevance propagation method given uh, in Buck et al. Uh, this is an efficient method uh, where the output can be decomposed and uh, it is equal to the relevances of the nodes uh, in any layer L. So we will decompose the final output prediction and uh, backpropagate it all the way towards the input to find the relevance of a given input uh, in the prediction output. And we'll term this as our attributions. So uh, for example, we can see in this equation, any node uh, relevance at node can be broken down into multiple messages uh, where from R from J to I in L to L plus one, which signifies that relevance from node J in their L plus one is uh, sent to node uh, i in layer L. So we can say that relevance at node i in layer L is equal to sum of all the messages in layer L plus one whose input is i. Similarly, the relevance uh, of node j at layer L plus one will be equal to sum of all the messages going out from uh, this node j to all of its inputs. This relevance uh, layer wise relevance propagation method follows a conservation property according to which the sum of relevances at all the needs, uh, nodes at layer L will be equal to the relevances of all the nodes at layer L plus one. So um, we'll define a general decomposition rule uh, given as uh, here RJ is decomposed from uh, kth node, AJ is the activation of jth node and WJK is the weight of the node uh, path connecting node J to node K. This is a general uh, decomposition rule. In the next slide, uh, we would see uh, how this LRP decomposition rule is split into four different stages uh, to give uh, LRP formula for a dense layer from layer L to layer L plus one. Uh, so if we define a dense layer, Y equals to W A plus B, where A are the activations, W is the weight matrix, and R L plus one is the output relevance of the L plus one layer. We will have this four stages. Uh, forward pass, that will be defined as Z equals to W A plus B plus epsilon. Here, epsilon is generally used for LRP epsilon rule, uh, which is used in the lower layers of the model for calculating the uh, relevance propagation. Second stage uh, is the element-wise division. Uh, the formula is S equals to R of L plus one by Z. Third is a backward pass, uh, where C equals to W transpose S. And last is an element-wise product. That is the relevance of the input layer L, which is given as A into C. Uh, the LRPs uh, for other layers uh, can be found in the appendix section of our paper. So we'll move forward to explain uh, the attribution system for the stage transition. So we will uh, term the relevance of the output uh, as Y out one, since we're interested in the attribution of the conversion. And the only layer connecting uh, the stage output to the Y out is a, uh, is a dense layer. So here we'll be using a LRP dense uh, that will take as an input Y out one uh, activations Y1 to YR and the model weights uh, to give the uh, relevances of the stage outputs R1 to RRR. Next, we will normalize these relevances. Now, each of these relevance uh, is a two dimensional vector belonging, uh, which can be seen as RI1, RI2. So, the attribution for the ith stage transition will be the sum of this uh, two dimensional vector RI1 plus RI2. The formula can be seen. So moving forward, now we'll uh, calculate the attribution for the touch points. Uh, so first we'll calculate the relative attribution of touch point towards each stage transition. So let AIJ be the jth touch point attribution towards the ith stage transition and RIJ be the relevances at the input node uh, of ZIJ. So uh, we'll backpropagate the relevance from RIs, which was the relevance of stage output all the way to the input uh, using this relevance backpropagation method that uses these three LRPs. First is an LRP dense, which will be used at the topmost layer. Next, we have a series of multiple LRP cons and LRP skip connection uh, for each of the TCN block. So uh, 
recalling that z ij belongs to uh, r raised to p plus eq now each of this uh, rij will also belongs to uh, r raised to p plus eq and to get the relative touch point attribution we will add uh, the relevances at all this p plus eq coordinates for a single zij this was the relative attribution for a touch point for the stage now to uh, now the touch point uh, may occur at various stages so to calculate the effective or uh, final touch point attribution we will have to uh, aggregate the touch point attributions at different stages the equation can be seen here similarly for the channel attributions uh, suppose if we want to calculate the attribution for peak channel then we'll calculate or aggregate the touch point attribution for all the touch points which occurred through channel p moving to our data sets uh, so we compared our model with other uh, baseline models using these two data sets first was a data set from fortune 500 company that sells his marketing automation software to uh, other customers a second one was also a leading global technology company uh, we had a large number of data set in the first data set having 55k journeys where we use 44k for training and 5.5k and 5.5k for validation and test the total number of channels here were 53 uh, similarly, for second data set, we had comparatively low number of journeys, uh, total 16k journeys, out of which 10k for, for train and rest were divided for validation and test. And uh, the total number of channels here were 38. In both the data sets, uh, the journey lengths varied from 5 to 1000. Then we used the four stages discussed earlier uh, customer known, lead created, opportunity created, and journey closed. The features used for training uh, were our time uh, timestamp dependent feature and feature uh, frequency features. And last one was a categorical channel ID feature. As we can see from the plots, uh, we have ample number of journeys with uh, journey length greater than 1000. For data set one, approximately 6000 journeys are there. And even for data set two, we have ample number of journeys for very large journey lengths. So this is a character trait for, of a B2B journey. And uh, after showing the conversion met uh, the accuracy metrics will prove the superiority of our model over other baseline models. So these are few baseline models. First is a logistic regression model that use channel frequencies and touch point preceding each stage transition as a feature. Uh, second one is a additional multi-touch attribution model or AMTA model that is survival analysis based model. Third one is an ARN model that we have discussed earlier. And the last one is an LRTT model. That is uh, a logistic regression based global attention weights model, uh, which is applied over a bidirectional RNN layer. We'll discuss the experiments. Uh, we performed hyperparameter tuning on both our model and all the baseline models in a random grid with 100 settings. Uh, and we trained all the models on each of the 100 settings and chose the best hyperparameter for each model on the basis of AUC ROC score and the validation data. And the metrics used for the comparison were uh, AOC ROC score and accuracy. As we can see, uh, our model clearly performs uh, best for both the data sets in both the metrics AOC ROC score and accuracy as compared to other baseline models. So uh, having proven superiority and we have a way of attribution also, now we'll define uh, a validation technique for these attributions. So we adapt a region perturbation method defined in uh, SUMEC et L that uh, uses uh, that is very effective to calculate the importance of a subset R uh, towards the final conversion label by deleting that subset from the input sequence and observing the drop in conversion probability using a matrix uh, here we have defined as AOPC score that is uh, area over morph prediction curve. Let the input sequence be uh, X1 to Xn and here O, which is R1 to RL, be a set of L subsets taken from X. And H is a heat mapping function uh, that maps the uh, subsets R to its, uh, how effective they were towards the conversion label. So we delete this touch points uh, or this subset R from the input using a morph process uh, in a recursion cycle. So X morph zero is equals to X. That is no touch points are yet deleted. Uh, and this G is a function that deletes this RK set of touch points uh, from the X morph K minus one to get X morph K. So here we have defined an AOPC rule to measure this uh, drop in accuracy. 
Uh, so this is basically uh, the change uh, average over change in conversion probability for different perturbation sizes. The L here is defined as the perturbation size. So means if the heat mapping function are arranged in decreasing order, we expect our model to have the highest AOPC as compared to other models. So uh, we'll give results for touch point attribution. Uh, so as we can see, we have compared only for three models because the other baseline models do not uh, give a touch point level attribution. So the main idea here over is to delete touch points in decreasing order of the attribution and capture the change in uh, conversion probabilities. So if a touch point is very effective over, uh, towards the conversion probability, then we will see a large drop in conversion probability and thus we'll see a high AOPC score. So as we can see for both the data sets, uh, our model stage GCN give the highest AOPC score as compared to both the other models. Uh, next, we give the results for general attribution. So here uh, we again measured the AOPC using a counterfactual uh, situation where we deleted all the touch points uh, occurring from the topmost channel uh, attribution. And as you can see that our model again gives the uh, strictly highest AOPC as compared to all the other baseline models. Here we also chose the top five uh, channels as uh, with respect to stage TCN and give the comparison of the uh, attributions of from all other baselines. Uh, we'll talk about stage transition attributions. Now, since uh, no other model has ever uh, given attribution to stage transitions, we are restricted to only give insights about the transition. So uh, we get calculated a stage transition at the journey level, and then we aggregate the uh, attributions for all the journeys, all the converted journeys, and show this in the table. As you can clearly see for the opportunity created or journey close stage, we have the highest attribution. While it is low for the initial two stages, uh, which is understandable because they are farther from conversion. But we would also like to note that for a very high number of journeys, the customer known stage gets a high attribution. While uh, for 24% of journeys, the opportunity created uh, gets a very low attribution, less than 1%. When we look at the journey level, so this indicates that uh, although at the aggregate level, uh, these two stages get high attribution, but at the journey level, uh, for a very large chunk of journey, uh, customer known or lead created becomes more important as compared to other stage transitions. So lastly, we give attribution insights for the stage transition. Uh, relative attribution for stage transition. So initially we calculated the touch point relative attribution to stage transition. We aggregate those uh, uh, across ch different channels to get uh, relative channel attribution at journey level and aggregate them over all the converted journeys to get, uh, get the final channel attribution relative to each stage transition and represent them in the main two channels here in the table. So as we can see the lead, uh, the email, which is a very major channel, uh, compared in the, when compared to aggregate level, it gets very high attribution when it is in lead created stage, but when it is in other stages, it does not get very high attribution. This indicates that, uh, a channel, uh, can be a very important in a particular stage transition while being, uh, unimportant when it occurs in other stage transitions, but this may help businesses to, uh, prioritize channels, uh, with an ongoing customer journey. Uh, so these are some conclusions we uh, drew from the papers. I think in the interest of time, uh, I'll end my presentation and I'm ready to take up any questions. Thank you, Anika. That was very, very interesting. And I think it has many um, applications, this research, but maybe you could, you could tell like, um, is there the application that for a given customer we can we can tell something because I understand you have some set of journeys over many customers and then we you can learn something so this is more like a data analysis right but if I have one particular customer and I want to predict something about it uh, can we use your model to to maybe on the way oh. of this customer in the middle of the journey predict this customer will uh, buy a product or not uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I would like to highlight that uh, there are many features that are persona specific, which uh, even though we have not captured currently in our data set uh, due to the limitation of uh, the given data set, but if we capture those features as well, 
then it will take uh, a specific customer related features also into consideration. And when uh, we draw our insights over the specific customers uh, journeys, we can use them for an on ongoing customer uh, journey to fetch uh, st strategic allocation of uh, the budget. Okay, uh, I see. I see for a particular customer, right? That, that's possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone has questions or comments? Maybe you maybe can... I have one one uh, yeah. short question. Uh, you showed basically in your slide that you have on slide twenty three uh, that you have um, um, an opportunity created with a chance of uh, 40, 84 percent. So this is extremely high. This number. So do you have uh, so so again? Can you just uh, in one or two sentences can you explain why it is possible to be so sure here uh, in contrast to let's say uh, customer known two point seven? So why uh, why is this so high? Uh, if we try to draw some insights, we can say that uh, a customer means many customers come to the initial stages where they are known to the sorry. Uh, known to the uh, buyer company, but uh, most of them uh, did fail to uh, convert into a, uh, a, a conversion. They, they fail to purchase. But we can say that if a customer is uh, occurring in an opportunity created event, then it is very likely that uh, he will he will uh, turn into a converted journey. That's why uh, we can say that if. Uh, we can allocate more budget towards this particular stage transition at an aggregate level. Uh, but again, uh, for the insights, we drew that um, many for major chunk of journeys, uh, more than 24, 25% journeys, uh, we get very high attribution for uh, the initial level uh, stages also and low for the opportunity created. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? You can write on the chat if you want, or just speak directly. Uh, Cynthia, I think you have a raised hand. I oh, know. Okay, this is uh, just applause. Um, sorry for that. Uh, I have one more question in that case. Uh, why you didn't use LSTM? It, because you talk about this um, long-term vanishing pro uh, problem. Could you use LSTM bidirectional LSTM, for example, as a baseline, may maybe, or as your method? Uh we could definitely use bi-directional LSTM, but still uh, we can uh, go towards TCN model due to the reason that it has a wide receptive field. Uh, as I s mentioned in a previous slide, that the receptive field of the TCN model increases exponentially with the uh, increase in number of layers. Like uh, if we have a, a large receptive, large uh, digestion factor of suppose three or four raised to L, then uh, we'll have a very huge receptive field, uh, okay. which will be very large if we ever compare to any TCN model. Uh, uh, sorry, LSTM model. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah, that could be one factor. Um, okay, the last chance for asking questions. Um, I don't see any, so yeah, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And let's move on to the second presentation. I would like to ask uh, Lirong to share her slides. Yeah. Um, can you hear me and uh, see my sc uh, screen clearly? Yes, all is fine. You can start. Sure. Um, hello, guys. My name is Li Rong Zhang. And uh, I want to first start with a uh, brief introduction. Uh, I was born and lived in Shanghai, China until I graduated from college, and I came to Japan to study at University of Tsukuba. I spent three years studying for a master's degree in informatics and graduated in March this year. My research interests include temporal information retrieval, background article recommendation, and query intention detection. I hope this short introduction will help you to get to know me better. So this paper will be presented by the following five parts. Let's start with the research introduction. 
The title of this paper is Thematic Modeling of Document Focus Time for Temporal Information Retrieval. Two related research backgrounds can be generated from it. One is document focus time, and another is called temporal information retrieval. The definition of document focus time is the time period which the document contents refer to. Related works in this area, including taking advantage of temporal expressions or named entities. Some neural network-based approaches trying to transfer temporal expressions into vectors showing potential ability of leveraging semantic information of text. Another field which is called temporal information retrieval has a wide background. This paper focuses on two specific tasks, named the temporal information retrieval and temporal diversity retrieval. Temporal information retrieval aims at ranking documents from different temporal queries intents coming from the same topic. However, temporal diversity retrieval emphasizes optimizing the ranking of documents for up to four different temporal classes for a given topic, as well as producing temporally diverse search results. Two main problems can be observed in the current approach of document focus time and temporal information retrieval. One is the inconsistency between documents' contents and published dates. Ranking methods based on uh, publication dates are unreliable. For example, if you just search COVID-19 death rate of America in 2020, most of the top ranked documents are published in 2020, uh, 21. And if systems using 2020 to filter uh, temporal irrelevant documents, those top ranked, uh, top ranked documents will be flattered. Another issue is estimating focus time of unstructured text. Um, despite uh, the sparsity of temporal expressions and the named entities, some unstructured text may not contain uh, named entities or any kinds of temporal expressions, but have obvious temporal intention. For example, uh, thinking the text Woman driving an SUV into Beijing in Para Palace. It is rarely happened and can be located in the exact time step. Based on these observations, we aim to find a solution to detect the temporal intentions for this unstructured text without relying on temporal expressions or named entities. Two objectives are included in this paper. One is to overcome the sparsity of temporal expressions or named entities in the document. Another goal is to evaluate, is to evaluate our estimated docu document focus time in temporal information retrieval tasks. Two objectives are said to answer different research questions. For uh, objective one, we intend to answer uh, can semantic information overcome the sparsity of temporary expressions or named entities? And for the second objective, we try to answer three, three research questions. One is, can document focus time deal with different temporal queries equally? And can document focus time be a substitute of publication date or last update time? And finally, Will the rank performance be affected by different aspects of query time? Here is the scope and the limitations of this uh, study. This study is about estimating the document focus time by leveraging a semantic based model, which was constructed by PyTorch and Transformers Library. The training data set is an English news corps, which contains uh, 3,800. Uh, 3,800,000 news articles. Document index and BM25 retrieval was conducted on Epic Solar platform. The, uh, the, uh, the, the limitation is that uh, this, corpse only, uh, did this approach only verified on the time span between May 2011 to March 2013. And uh, it can only deal with the month level estimation. The whole retrieval uh, system was a downstream retrieval system. Next part is about the methodologies. 
So first, in order to understand the semantic information de delivered by a document from the time dimension, we first capture its temporal information at a sentence level. We first separate temporal and non-temporal sentences from a document. We define sentences with uh, explicit temporal expressions are temporal sentences. Non-temporal sentences refer to sentences with no temporal expressions. The bird-based model was fine-tuned to capture uh, the relations between semantic information and the temporal intention. The input is the temporal sentences combined by its neighbor sentences to this uh, ambiguity that sentences uh, have uh, multiple temporal intentions, just like, um, for example, uh, Olympic Tokyo, it can refer to the time uh, period 2022 or, or uh, 1970 uh, years. So the input for the uh, semantic model is the uh, temporal sentences, and the output is a uh, reformed time period, which is unified to the month granularity. The semantic model will give the temporal intention of a sentence. And as for the focus time of documents, we calculate each sentence's temporal intention and further drive them into three types of document focus time, uh, which are uh, frequency-oriented focus time and the mean focus time. Uh, the third one is query dependent focus time. So frequency oriented focus time will give us the most frequency time period between the uh, sentences of a document. And the mean focus time will give us the mean value uh, between the uh, of, of the among the sentences from a document. Uh, in particular, we first transfer all the uh, times into seconds and calculated uh, the mean value. And we generated the time to the month granularity. So uh, in the mean focus time calculation, we just uh, consider that each sentence is with um, equally to each other. In the third one, query dependent focus time, uh, we think that uh, sentences that um, are sem more semantic similar to the query, they should be weighted higher in the uh, document calculate uh, estimation process. So uh, we further introduce the query dependent focus time. We calculate uh, each sentence's semantic similarities you know, to the queries and then multiple uh, to their uh, focus time and then calculated the mean value. In the context of temporal information retrieval, we have to consider both uh, textual and the temporal relevancy. The final rank score should be uh, should, rep re should represent the relevance to the query as well as relevance to the temporal query intents. For this purpose, we leveraged a simple linear combination. Uh, where SQD denotes the rank score of document D with respect to query Q. SBM25 scores are used to represent the textual relevance. W delta Q denotes the temporal relevance. I will further explain the way of calculating W delta Q in the next page. So um, W delta Q is designed to satisfy three characters of three uh, different query types. It should fulfill that. Uh, first, for the past query type, a document with a smaller focus time than query's focus time should have a higher temporal relevancy. And it receives a penalty uh, if a larger focus time is estimated. The situation is vice versa on the future query type. For the recency query type, the more close a document focus time is to the query focus time, the higher temporal relevancy uh, the document receives. The parameter delta in the formulas are the day distance between the focus time of uh, document and the queries. We introduced two 
ways of getting query focus time for better understanding of temporal relevance between query time and document time. One is called query issue time, which stands for when the query is issued. And another is named as query trend time, uh, which stands for the most popular time period of the query topic. Uh, here you can see the whole framework of temporal information retrieval. Given subtopic queries, we first run BM25 retrieval and get four subsect result. Then we calculate temporal relevance between, uh, based on two types of query focus time and three types of document focus time. We then re-rank and uh, get uh, top 10 documents based on the final rank score. To verify the effectiveness of calculated document focus time, we further applied them into temporal diversity retrieval task. Based on the temporal information retrieval framework, we will get uh, four subsets documents of four temporal classes. To evaluate the diversity, we created a merged retrieval set and create intentions. The intention stands for the temporal intentions of documents. For example, if this document belongs to the past subset, it will have P as the temporal intention. Note that each document only gets one intention. If a document appears in multiple subsets, the temporal intention of this document is the subset where it is ranked the highest. After that, we compare the semantic similarity between articles, titles, and topics through the uh, sentence transformer model and we rank them according to the similarity scores. Next, I will present experimental settings. The text collection we leveraged is called the Living Knowledge Corps, evaluating different aspects of temporal information retrieval. 50 topics are provided for each task. Here is an example. Each topic has four subtopics of different temporal classes. We verified the effectiveness of our calculated document focus time into two tasks, temporal information retrieval and temporal diversity retrieval. For uh, temporal information retrieval task, we set up two baselines. Uh, one is BM25 retrieval, and the other is using published date to calculate uh, it, using the published date as the document focus time to calculate temporal relevancy. And we have two experiment groups. One is using query issue time, and the other is using query trend time. For each group, we evaluated the effectiveness of three types of focus time. And for the uh, temporal diversity uh, retrieval task, the baseline method is BM25 retrieval, followed by a round robin method to create a diversified rank. This approach is also the best uh, approach in the TDI, TDR task uh, overview paper. Uh, the, the run we created is using the query trend time with the best combination of different focus time within different qu uh, query types. The metric we we'll use to evaluate uh, this approach is NDCG cut 5 and the D sharp NDCG cut 20. NDCG cut 5 uh, should tell the ranking performance on the top five documents, and the D sharp NDCG cut 20 should tell the ranking performance considering diversity on the top 20 documents. In the next part, I will present results of the experiments and the major findings observed from the result. Here is the result of temporal information retrieval task. The column uh, BM25 stands for the weak baseline and PD stands for the strong baseline using published date as the document focus time. Three middle columns stand for our calculated document focus time. Results are separated into two groups. The upper one is using, uh, the, upper, uh, the upper row uh, is using uh, query issue time, and the second row is using query trend, trend time. 
First of all, by observing the best score in the middle columns to the BM25 baseline, we can see that the performance increased after the ranking uh, documents by temporal aspects. However, uh, comparing our re result to publication date baseline, the focus time only surpasses the publication date in the case of mean uh, focus time with past queries and the query dependent uh, focus time with future queries. However, those who did not perform better than publication date also brought competitive performance compared to BM25 which uh, indicates our focus time can be a dependable reference or supplementary rather than just relying on document publication date. And uh, we uh, discovered that uh, different types of focus time works differently in query types. Main focus time works well in past and uh, recent query types. As for the, query, uh, as for the future query, type, query-dependent focus time gives the best performance. This finding indicates that focus time cooperating to future queries should consider the semantic similarity between content and queries, while focus time cooperating to other query types should consider independently from queries. And next, by comparing the uh, experiment experimental group uh, between query issue time and the query trend, trend time, uh, we can discover that query trend time group pro performs better than issue time group in most cases. We further calculate, uh, calculated ranking uh, improvement on documents with different temporal expression amounts. The rank performance got improved among all query types where documents temporal expressions were less than four. As for the past and the future uh, query type, all situations improved while the recent type's uh, performance went down after temporal expressions exceeded four. We, uh, calculate, we calculated the average amount of temporal expressions in each document uh, in, in the results flatted by the BN BM25 retrieval, the number is 4.23. So uh, our method uh, does affect a little um, temporal expressions documents. And compared to the issue time, future and the recent query types got much improvement, while past queries improvement is lower than using issue time. This may explain that queries asking for past information depend more on when they are issued, and the queries aiming for uh, recent and future information should consider more when they are asked the most. Relations of query time and the query type should be studied in the future work. Here is the score uh, showing how uh, the uh, how our estimated docker document focus time performed in the temporal diversity retrieval task. We compared our result with the best result in the task introduced uh, over well, uh, overview paper, which used the BM25 to retrieve documents for each temporal subtopics and adopted a round robin method to create diversified rank result. The, uh, from the scores, we can conclude that our proposed algorithm can effectively improve the temporal diversity of retrieval results while ensuring the relevance of articles. Uh, next, I will present the discussions based on research questions. So for the research question one, can semantic information overcome the sparsity of temporal expressions or named entities? So regard to the sparsity of temporal expressions, the answer is yes. Our uh, mass approach can improve documents have, uh, which have less uh, temporal expressions. And uh, however, the ability of our model in overcoming the sparsity of named entities have not been explored well in this paper. 
So for research question two, can document focus time deal with different temporal query equally? The answer is no. Uh, we observe that each type of focus time plays a different role for different types of retrieval queries. Mean focus time performs better than others in recent and past queries, while query dependent focus time defeated others in future query uh, type. So for the research question three, can document focus time be a substitute of publication date or the last update time? Uh, the, answer, the answer is yes. Our best focus time results show competitive perform performance against the publication date. This suggests that the proposed method is useful uh, when the main content of the document is inconsistent with the publication date and the document lacks a reliable publication, publication date. The final research question, will the rank performance be affected by different aspects of query time? Uh, the answer is yes. By comparing the result between the issue time group and trend time group, we found that using the popular time of... Yes. Can better represent users' temporal intention than issue time. So here is the limitation and significance of this paper. And uh, we, uh, I would like to express sincere thanks to the organizers uh, of NTCIR Templaria for providing data sets. And we also want to thank Dr. Adam uh, for giving us the inspirations and kindly answering our questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Li Rong. So, um... Are there any questions? Okay, maybe while others are thinking what to ask, I will ask my questions. So um, it's quite interesting concept that you introduced query dependent focus time. I I, I was not aware of that, but yes. can you can you provide a definition? What actually is query dependent focus time? How to understand it? Uh, so, uh, query dependent focus time. Uh, is uh, a command uh, section run on uh, devices, and uh, these commands can be used to control the output. Uh, was there someone answering your, your question? This voice? What was that? Uh, Sorry. Me... I think we're having a little bit of a cross feedback. I'm not sure who that is talking. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's some noise and during presentation we could yes. hear also. Well, let's hope it will not be anymore. Yes, Lirong, please. Yes, so the semantic model will give us the focus time of a sentence. And uh, the query dependent focus time means um, uh, when we generate each sentence is focused time into the final document focus time. We will consider the semantic similarities between this sentence and the queries. If these sentences are very, uh, uh, very similar to the queries, it should be weight uh, higher in the calculation or estimation of document focus time. So uh, we have a semantic similarity score between sentences and queries. This score is between zero and, uh, zero and one. We multiply uh, this score to each sentence's focus time and then plus them together and then divide, uh, divide the uh, total sentence number. The final uh, score is uh, defined the, the final um, yes, score is the uh, query dependent focus time we want. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's all clear. Thank you. Mark has some question. Mark. Yes, uh, yes, please. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. I have just one uh, or two uh, short questions. So the data set you mentioned is English news articles, 3.8 million documents. So which data set in particular is it? Is it publicly uh, uh, available? Yes, uh, you, you need to access the website and uh, submit a request form. So which, which data set it is exactly? 
Uh, it's called NPCIR Living Knowledge Dataset. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Living Knowledge. Okay. I, I think I know. Yes. Uh, this is fine. And uh, then one more question here. When you do the time extraction and normalization, did you use a tool like Heidel Time or how did you do it? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat your question again? Yes, you mentioned that you do uh, uh, time point uh, extraction and temporal references. So did you use a tool like Heidel Time or how did you basically get to the to the time points? Uh, uh, did, did you mean how I uh, calculate the focus time of queries? No, how, how do you identify the time points in the documents? Oh. Did you use any temporal tagger to identify temporal exactly. expressions? Yes. Um. Can you show the bird a picture with the bird? Okay. You see, yeah. there is this temporal expression 2019, right? How did you find it? Uh, yes, uh, there, there is a time tag in the original corpse. Uh, I just extracted the time tag from, from the corpus and then uh, normalized it to the month granularity. Okay, thank you. So it's already pre-processed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, let me ask one more question because uh, it's quite interesting about this trend uh, focus time. How do you compute this trend? Did you use any things like Google Trends? Uh, yes, I uh, extracted the uh, trend time from Google Trends. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, the query topic was provided uh, by the corps and I uh, searched, uh, but I, uh, I using this topic to search in Google Trends and uh, extracted the most uh, uh, popular time period uh, between the exact same time span of the uh, living knowledge course. Okay, I see. Okay, good. Um, right, so if there are no more questions and we are actually at the right time, so uh, let's just uh, thank Lirong uh, and let's move to the next presentation because I think speaker is not with us, right? Right, if you'll stop sharing, then I can get the video up and coming. Um, okay. Thank you. And do you all see that, Adam? Yeah, you, okay, we good. can see. I'm can gonna start play? playing and let's make sure we can hear. Okay. Hi, my name is Alexandra Porter and I'm gonna be talking about analytical models for motifs and temporal networks. In this talk, I'll first describe the problem setting and motivation, then discuss some related work. Then I'll introduce our temporal activity state block model and our analytical model for temporal motifs. Finally, I'll discuss some experimental results on synthetic and real world data. So first I'll talk about our problem setting. Our problem is motivated as follows. Network structure often represents relationships which are not constant over time. Temporal or time bringing edges appear and disappear over time. Examples of temporal networks might include email or financial transaction networks. In particular, in an email network, emails are sent at a particular time, and thus an edge might appear from the sender to the receiver at some point in time. Recurring patterns in temporal networks provide information about network functionality. In this work, we consider a temporal graph as follows. Temporal graphs are ones in which edges are timestamped and also may appear more than once with distinct timestamps. In this example here, each one of these edges has a timestamp, and so that's the time at which it occurs. The temporal motif is a subgraph and an ordering on the edge appearances. 
Uh, for example, if you had three vertices forming a triangle, an example of a temporal motif might be the edge from X to Y appearing, and then the edge from X to Z, and then the edge from Y to Z. And this may also come with a time window restriction, which is the maximum difference between the first and the last edge. An example of a temporal motif in the actual graph is then a mapping of these nodes X, Y, and Z to three nodes in the actual graph, such that there are instances of the three edges appearing in the order and within the time window limit of 12 hours. I'll briefly describe a few areas related work to ours. There are temporal extensions of static models. There are exact counting of temporal motifs. There are heuristic and empirical graph ensemble techniques. And finally, motif counting on stream data. And some in particular references for each of these is listed here. I'll next describe our temporal activity state block model. This is based on a temporal variant of the stochastic block model. In this, we group together nodes with similar out and in edge traffic for each time interval of length t. In particular, we let r denote a partition labeled from 1 to c in of the nodes based on their receiving of in links. And similarly, we let S labeled from one to C out denote a partition of nodes based on sending out links. For each time interval, which is the ith time interval, every node in the vertex U is then in a member of each partition. So R of U at time T denotes which member of the partition R U is in, and S of U at time T denotes the partition S. So next we'll talk about how we infer edges in this model. Edges are described by an arrival rate matrix theta, which has dimensions C out by C in. So the dimensions are the number of categories of out rate and the number of categories of in rate. Then a particular entry, entry in this matrix, such as theta at index SR, is the rate of temporal edges from nodes in a partition, small s and s, to the nodes in partition, small r and r. Temporal edges between every node pair uv are then modeled as independent Poisson draws parameterized by theta su rv at time t, where this is the product of the out rate for that category of out traffic for the node u and the rate of the in traffic for the category that node V is in. So next, how do we infer these parameters? In general, the goal is to count in and out edge frequency for each node on some fixed time window. To do this in two passes, you can first count all the frequencies and then determine which groupings to assign the nodes to. And so this would take two passes, one to determine what the grouping threshold should be and when to assign the nodes. However, this can also be approximated in one pass by using a predetermined set of rate groups. So next we think about how we're going to map this to the concept of motifs. So suppose we have some example, which is a subgraph of a larger graph, and we're going to suppose that our nodes here fall into three different categories. So nodes A, B, and C, and then nodes C and E, and then nodes G, H, and F are going to represent three different levels of either out or in activity state. Then we assign a partition, V, which has three sets corresponding to these three groups of activity levels. Then to map this to a motif, we assign a activity state to each member of the motif. So for example, in this triangle, it's one particular case that two of the vertices would be members of the activity state V1 and one members of the activity state V3. Then to look at how this actually maps to vertices from the original graph, we can pick different combinations of vertices from each activity state to map to the vertices corresponding to that activity state on a more abstract mapping of the motif. So in particular, the left example, nodes B and C are both in category V1, so they can correspond to the two nodes of the motif labeled with activity state V1 
And then node D is in B3, so that can be the third node in the motif. So now I'll discuss our analytical model for counting temporal motifs. Formally, we define tem a temporal motif as follows. It's a K node Z edge temporal motif M consists of a graph GM with vertices BM and edges EM, such that the vertices set is of size K and the edge set is of size Z, and there's a strict total ordering on the edges. In particular, we're gonna index the edges in order E1 through EZ according to the total ordering. From this, we can then formally define a delta instance of a temporal motif. A temporal subgraph, GS, with vertices VS and edges ES, with a set of temporal edges, ES, where each edge is a graph edge, uh, such as E1 through EZ, in a pair along with a timestamp. And this is a delta instance of a temporal motif M if the following conditions are met. The first one is isomorphism. So this is just that there exists an edge preserving bijection between the vertices of this temporal subgraph, GS, and the motif M. Next is temporal ordering. So this says that if we map the edges according to the edge preserving bijection, uh, according to the isomorphism, they have to still be in the order as imposed by the motif definition of M. Finally, uh, there's a temporal window restriction, which is this, that the difference between the first edge instance and the last edge instance in ES must be at most delta. So the goal for our analytical model is to derive the expected number and the variance of delta instances of a given temporal motif in a time varying network. We give a closed form expression for expected values and for variance of the motif counts. And our approach is scalable with a computation of complexity on the order of C to the K, where C is the number of activity states and K is the number of nodes in the motif. Notably, both of these can be constant in practice, such that the complexity is constant. So first, uh, to think about the expected count of motifs, we'll consider the case when the time window over which we're doing a computation is at most the size of the motif window delta. The expected number of delta instances of a K node Z edge temporal motif M in a network with a set Z of nodes modeled by a temporal activity state block model with C states during a time interval T naught to T naught plus T for some T at most equal to delta is as follows. The first term is the expected number of K node Z edge isomorphic subgraphs to the motif graph GM in a temporal network with V nodes modeled by a temporal activity state block model with C states. The second term is then the probability that the timestamps of the edges in each isomorphic subgraph occur in the imposed order of the motif in a time window of length delta. We next consider the case when T is strictly greater than delta. The expected number of delta instances of a temporal motif M and a temporal activity state block model during a time interval T naught to T naught plus T for T strictly greater than delta is as follows. We first have a term for the case when the entire motif appears in T naught plus T minus delta to T naught plus T. So this is a window of length delta and so we can separate out this case as one in which the interval is equal to the motif window. For the second case, we then, similar to as before, have two terms to compute this value. The first is the expected number of K nodes Z edge isomorphic subgraphs to the motif graph GN with the condition on the first edge time T1 times the probability of edge arriving in order. And this, as shown here, would be computed similarly to as before. Next, we consider how you would compute variance. So using the formula for variance, we see that the first term is the expected frequency of pairs of delta instances. So the possible pairs of two, for two instances of a particular motif are shown here. And in particular, what we're highlighting is that you have to consider the possible cases for how these motifs overlap. 
they may not overlap at all, or they may entirely overlap with all of the same vertices, and thus the edges are just different instances of the same uh, node pair, meaning their edges are just the same edges appearing at different times. Then to compute the second term to complete this, we just square the expected value like we have in the previous slides. Next, I'll summarize our experimental results on both synthetic and real world data. So first, to summarize the motifs we've studied, we compute our results for all two and three node motifs with three edges as outlined here. We use a categorization as follows. First, there are the triangles, which are in the gray box in the upper left. Then there are the two node motifs, which are in the green box in the upper right. Then we're what we call reciprocated edge motifs, which are the middle two rows. And finally, double edge motifs, which are the last two rows. The measure we're going to use is mean squared relative error, computed as shown here where NMI is the actual number of motif instances counted using the method of Perenjape et al. in the ICE-generated network for an ensemble of random networks. NM is the expected motif frequency calculated by our framework, and we're going to compare these two values in a variety of settings. First, we look at the accuracy of our model inference. We compute MSRE for varying numbers of groups C used by the temporal activity state black model when T is equal to 10,000 and delta is equal to 5,000. We consider values calculated over 30 networks generated with 300 nodes and cases in which C out is equal to C in and both are equal to the square root of C. So this means our total number of activity states is equal to C out times C in and we have the same number of activity states for out edges and in edges. What we see is very quickly as we increase C, the MSRE gets very small, and so it doesn't seem like we need a particularly high number of activity states to achieve fairly high accuracy, at least on this set of graphs. Next, we look at how well our model performs as we adjust hyperparameters. In particular, we vary the average degree of the graphs, the motif window, delta, and the time window, t. So in the first plot on the top, we're increasing the average degree of the graph, and we see as the graphs get denser, the MSRE does converge close to zero. In the second plot, we're looking at increasing the time window delta. So as this increases, edges can be counted as the same motif when they're further and further apart from each other in the timeline of edge occurrences. And as this increases, the MSRE also converges. Finally, we consider wider and wider time ranges. And again, as we have a bigger T, so we're doing a computation over a larger chunk of edges from the temporal graph, the MSRE does converge to zero. So next we consider the runtime of our method compared to counting motifs uh, using the parent job model. Particularly, we plot the average runtime of the temporal activity state block model and an implementation of the motif counting algorithm on synthetic graphs of increasing size. And we plot this on a linear scale on the left and the logarithmic scale on the right. What we see is, first of all, the runtime of our model, as expected, remains uh, close to constant as the number of edges increases, while the runtime of actual motif counting increases pretty drastically. Then zooming in and looking at what happens on the logarithmic scale, we have an interesting sort of step pattern happening in the computation for our model, but these actually correspond exactly to where the implementation determined that the value of C needed to be increased. And so it makes sense that as you increase the number of activity states, you get little jumps in increase in runtime. The first real world data we, that we consider is a financial transaction network which has approximately 118,000 nodes and about 3 million temporal edges. In this experiment, we set delta and t to both be equal to 90 days. So we're considering motifs of edges that can span up to 90 days from each other. And we're also computing our model on 90 day intervals over the timeline of the entire temporal graph. 
Here we've plotted the results for motifs F1 and A6, which are pretty representative of the results we got for the full set of motifs. And the interesting that you can notice in particular on motif F1 is a drop in both the actual observed motif counts and our modeled motif counts at the time that a financial crisis occurred in this country in September of 2011. Our next data set that we considered is an email network with 977 nodes and about 307,000 temporal edges. Here again, we use the same values for delta and t of 50 days, and we pulled out motifs F1 and A6 to plot. Here we see that the model accurately tracks the motif counts that are observed over time, including capturing the correct trends, even when the absolute values are somewhat disparate. So in conclusion, we've introduced a temporal activity state block model. It's fast and ac accurate method for expected count and variance of temporal motifs. We showed efficient parameter inference techniques and closed form solutions. And it's method accurately tracks motif counts on synthetic and real world data. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank the authors for that. And since um, they are not present here to answer questions, you can, uh, if you have any question, you can just send email uh, to the corresponding authors. Um, so there was the last presentation um, of this session and uh, we will have a panel later. And as Mark said, uh, it will start from uh, 4 p.m. So 15 minutes later than the schedule, right? Mark, please correct me if I am wrong. No, but, uh, no, no, perfectly fine. So uh, we will meet again at four o'clock. So if you potentially a few minutes earlier as usual, just to get together, but uh, we will start at four uh, with, uh, with a panel, yeah. Okay, perfect. Oh. So thank you all for attending this session and uh, please have a break for coffee or tea and we'll hopefully see each other in about 40 minutes. Thank you, bye-bye. But maybe let's start uh, about this uh, with the discussion from the lessons learned from today's workshop. And I also cordially invite uh, Adam and the remaining audience to join me now for the discussion. So, well, after now uh, three years in distance mode. So what are the key observations? So what is now, well, what can we learn from this, uh, or for the moment being from this distance uh, workshop? So is it, isn't it now time to go back to usual or to, to meeting us in, uh, in real life? So I have to say, uh, me myself, I'm missing these uh, online or these these real events uh, a lot. So meeting others, having um, a joint discussion uh, during a break or whatever. So what's your impression? So maybe Adam, uh, what do you think? So I am, um, yeah, I am a little bit on, on two lines because I like, uh, of course, meeting people and networking opportunities, but I like this kind of, um, yeah, easy way of participating in a conference full screen for me. I can see everything well, hear everything well, see the chat, I control everything very well and uh, not being interrupted by someone, I don't know, sitting next to me or opening door, leaving the room and so on. So there are positive and negative aspects. I think the best is hybrid and probably this will go um, for some conferences, at least for some years, um, because some people are just unable to also attend the conference. Some others want to attend the conference and don't like anything only purely online. So I think hybrid will be the way. Um, so probably the location factor will now be a more and more important. If a conference will be in a good location, people will travel. If not, they will take part offline. Yeah, we'll see how it goes, but I like both words combined. Well, this is true. Yeah, so both both have their uh, um, pros and cons, but definitely, uh, well, uh, meeting uh, in presence uh, is is in some places a clear asset. 
So now from today's lessons learned, so what are your uh, main impressions? So what is the next big thing in, uh, in temporal web analytics? So what did you take as well uh, the next thing uh, to look into uh, based on discussions uh, with others, but maybe also based on, uh, well, questions uh, that came up uh, when seeing uh, other presentations so uh, what's what's your uh, what's your next uh, or what what do you think uh, will be the next thing for you to do adam yeah so uh, i am a bit skewed because i'm deeply rooted in my own research so i will probably talk mainly about this one but in my impression um the web, ar web archiving may come back. It was a common research at some time. Then somehow it got quiet, the scene. But now, considering we have more than how many, 20, 15 years a long history of the web, the collected data is just huge, simply. And we can learn a lot of information from there for uh, business people, lawyers, journalists, um, even investors, as well as for just private persons who had lived at that time maybe want to come back to their web pages or uh, web pages of their schools or uh, social networks they took part at the time i don't know there could be probably many reasons to have this time travel so why not to build more models that will uh, make use of this accumulated true. data over true, time? True, Adam, but at the same time do you think all this data will be accessible i mean uh, web archive is one thing which is actually accessible but when it comes to uh, all the social network sites and so on and so forth. So first of all, these are not these are not really entirely called. Uh, they are not uh, completely accessible even uh, these days. And well, um, uh, I'm a bit uh, skeptical here that there is um, uh, well, uh, the opportunity to get all, to all these things um, easily. So what do you think here? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, why social networks do not provide such data, at least not, not so easily. But we start seeing more and more these kind of memories. Last year at that time, you did these and these, and they showed a picture that you uh, posted uh, around uh, this time last year or, or older. So I think having all this data, these social networks will also utilize it more. But uh, there's a valid point you mentioned, Mark, that uh, we researchers may not have access to it. However, some web archives, like Portuguese web archive, for example, provide already API with a searchable full text search interface. So you can not just browse the URL, just focusing on one URL, but simply issue any query to the past, and then you will have a ranked uh, past versions relevant to the query. You can do with them many things, re-rank, do question answering, some kind of evolution-like timeline, summarization or visualization. I, I believe more web archives will be also opening up because they are all striving for users, for user engagement. And just providing URL-based retrieval is not enough, right? And people are just get too much used to searching than, than browsing, right? So we have to search in these web archives. But what I wanted to say is not only about the web. We have all these accumulated data, like news articles in news archives, right? or book um, archives, scientific papers, and so on. Scientific paper is also an interesting um, type of documents because we often we often need to find something for citing. And, and the question is, uh, are we really making a new research? Because many times stuff has been already invented, maybe with different names or slightly different viewpoint, but already invented in the past. And we tend to forget, especially in computing, the span of uh, papers that we read is maybe two, three years and everything else we tend to start considering as old and obsolete, but that may not be true, right? So uh, I, I find a lot of here potential and uh, relatively little research going on in all this accumulated data, which is growing and growing, which means becoming even more important uh, as it was before. But I may be skewed. Maybe there are some other uh, potentially interesting research uh, venues. Uh, for well, me, these this temporal collections are promising. Well, this is true. But when you speak about the, uh, the Portuguese archive, 
I agree. I mean, they are doing uh, very interesting stuff uh, also together with your co-authors. I know they are doing uh, very nice things here. But we have to be honest. I mean, at the end of the day, the Portuguese archive uh, is not the largest uh, at all. I mean, they are doing a good job, but um, uh, it's not necessarily uh, covering all of the web, right? So, uh, well, for other stakeholders, um, I'm not so optimistic. I mean, I'm not uh, inside uh, the web archive in the United States um, to say well, what they are doing, but uh, we also have to say that uh, European archive, uh, this initiative um, has more or less uh, failed at some point of time, right? I mean, there was no there was no market model for um, something which was the European archive. So uh, maybe the question is how to now uh, also um, well uh, develop a proper business model. What do you think? Yeah, business model. It's indeed maybe far from radars of big companies because that's not the um kind of very good area to to earn money to propose some business model it's more like a more about community our heritage um open data i think we should consider in these aspects and perhaps because there are not big companies in this field maybe yet but they are not um, there are many opportunities for us for researchers in academia that could uh, provide some solutions uh, here um uh, that's true what you said about small size of Portuguese uh, web archive, but um, this archive is seen as a kind of precursor, I don't know, um, um, avant-garde perhaps of other web archives and often um, people consult uh, people from Archivo how to do certain things. I think other European national web archives, for example, like Austrian web archive may 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 just uh, follow the the trade they they even release for example um um uh, code and and um some sample code sample data and invite researchers to 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 do some work with the data provided right so there is this initiative i, I think going on without big companies without big players but trying to engage users um, but solutions applied are still very simple and not uh, relevant to 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 time temporal information retrieval or or uh, temporal NLP. So there's a lot of things uh, to be done. But it's just about the web, right? If we talk about temporal web, mainly web archive comes comes uh, to the mind. But if we just don't even focus on the web, we have so many other document types, as I said, news articles, especially. And this all comes now to digital humanities area and digital history, perhaps, which, um, yeah, do a lot of interesting things, but but uh, using technologies quite outdated, maybe TFIDF, maybe topic modeling. So I find a lot of potential for us computer science researchers to approach this digital history, digital humanities um, topics, problems using AI, machine learning techniques and, and temporal IR, temporal NLP like techniques that there has been in the community over time. Well, true, true. But here, what we have seen in recent years, I mean, uh, it has also been, well, at least from a European point of view, the case that, uh, at least to what I've seen and understood, is that basically also research funding in this area uh, has been somewhat reduced in this field. So it's not necessarily anymore um, that prominent like it was, uh, let's say, 15 years ago. Yeah? So uh, at least from the European um, dimension uh, level, I, uh, maybe I'm incorrect here and the others might uh, correct me. But uh, as far as I uh, saw it in recent uh, calls or whatever, this dimension is not so prominent anymore as it has been in, in previous times. So uh, in that regard, it's a bit, uh, well, uh, unfortunate um, uh, in my understanding. But well, this is just a personal uh, um, or a personal uh, impression uh, I've got. 
Uh, I mean, you mentioned in your keynote uh, or in your in your talk, um, secondly, also um, this aspect of uh, collective memory studies, uh, so which actually is also going into the uh, digital humanities, social sciences. So do you have any uh, cooperation partners here in this regard when you uh, talk about these uh, aspects? I'm mainly with computer scientists, not so much with historians or sociologists. Um, frankly speaking, we, we kind of stopped this research for some time because it was more analysis research rather than providing um, some technological solutions. Like we analyze how people remember the past on Twitter, in the news and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to come back to this topic if, if I find some uh, interested uh, student. Um, now I'm more focusing on question answering to um, to use this very booming field. Uh, I mean, technologies from this very growing field, like question answering, like multi-hop question answering, but use it for the past, uh, where the temporal IR especially uh, comes into play. And then you have many problems like this temporal ambiguity, which I talk about. Um, lack of content, so there is not much maybe redundancy. If you ask about some minor details from the past events, I think this is very exciting uh, research where AI techniques can be used. So perhaps for the grant, um, I mean, funding bodies, this might be more positioned like ML, uh, machine learning AI applications for knowledge retrieval. It doesn't have to be portrayed as a digital humanities or digital history, which maybe as you said uh, lost some kind of impetus in terms of funding uh, i'm not sure um, on this um but one thing i wanted to also add because we talk about history a lot right using this historical data and so on but obviously human is always trying to predict the future right trying to uh, guess what will be the future so why not to use and i don't see many research going on uh, in this field why not to use past information, past events, past causality, and so on, to try to predict the future. And that's one direction. And another direction, we have to remember there's a lot of future-related information on the web, right? People uh, post about some uh, hopes, predictions, expectations, uh, plans. Uh, there's a lot of this data. Why not to collect it, cluster it, and make sense of it, visualize and show um, to, to the user, of course, as a support for any decision making, we, we can't uh, substitute the user. So the history is could be a guidance for the uh, for the future prediction and also the current uh, opinions about future. And there's some research uh, that we have been also doing on recognizing future um, related sentences, all these combined together um, could could help us to predict what will be the future. And that, that's what people do, right? That's what even big companies might be interested also at. But, well, uh, I fully agree. So in, in some regard, so we, I have been working on a project some you know, 10 years ago, which was called uh, Living Knowledge or 10, 15 years ago. And uh, one of the work packages uh, there was the so-called future predictor. Yeah? So it was basically more or less what you say. Yeah? You collect statements of people um, in real time, but also in the past, uh, extract uh, time points, which are potentially, of course, in future, meaning uh, things like on two, uh, in 2050, uh, mankind will reach Mars or whatever. Yeah? And basically, uh, you collect and visualize these kind of statements uh, along a timeline. Yeah? Uh, clearly, uh, whether it will be uh, uh, true or not is a different story, right? Uh, depending on uh, which sources uh, you are basically uh, uh, considering. But uh, this project actually uh, went into that uh, direction, which indeed um, might be worse uh, to be revisited. Um, it was basically uh, at this point, it was driven by a company, a search company, which is not really anymore a search company, uh, which uh, uh, with five letters. Yeah. So um, uh, starting with <laughs> with a Y. Anyways, okay. uh, um, yeah, uh, it's actually uh, a company uh, or it was a project where also uh, Ricardo was uh, involved uh, in, in his team. So at this point of time, um, but well, uh, it's, it's quite some time uh, uh, since this uh, took place. 
Well, this is true. Uh, so from uh, well, from your keynote, also we had uh, a very interesting uh, and uh, stimulating uh, discussion. So for me, it was again uh, very interesting to see your work here on event summarization and uh, event time detection. Well, uh, I had already some questions to you uh, after the uh, keynote. But uh, well, again, one more question here. So uh, when talking about your studies here, uh, what is actually the entire size of these collections you are talking about? Is it only for the moment being only in quotation marks, the New York Times archive uh, that you are dealing with, or are you um, also working on uh, other more uh, real life web contents here? Yeah, we, we work mainly with New York Times collection because it has been used so much by other researchers. It's not too big, it's close to 2 million news articles, but sufficiently big to, to uh, you know, have many challenges and so on. Um, and, and so far it was okay, but in the past we also worked with the Times archive, which spans, I think, 200 years of um, long uh, collection of news articles from from UK, not from, from USA anymore. But that collection actually had a problem of OCR. I mean, if we went back, let's say 100 or even 50 years um, to the past, we, we have so many OCR problems that we needed to post-process the content ourselves to actually output some good results. So that's, that's uh, one issue here. But I think that there should be increasingly more available um, social network uh, data sets uh, like Twitter data sets or even this Amazon data set that I mentioned during my presentation has more than 140 million reviews, right? Over 20 years. Uh, it's a fantastic data set to see technology, for example, evolution, like uh, um, uh, devices to, to listen to music, like 15 years ago, what we used, what were the problems, what people didn't like in their reviews or had problem with, and now we can move on. So we also actually uh, try to, to understand the evolution of technology using this data set. We work on that. It was published in 2016 at World Wide Web, um, the paper on this topic. Uh, so. I mean, it's it's not only news New York Times or uh, not not the Times. We have increasingly more and more resources, and uh, I have this impression that the web is now speeding up so much with all these events going on. We move from COVID to war and so on. I will not mention all these events, uh, but you you probably agree with me that we have so much things going on in just one year as it was probably two, three years in the past or more. So even a short duration data set should have a lot of a lot of things there, right? A lot of evolution changes, uh, semantic drifts of concepts, um, interaction and, and so on. Oh, oh. No, no, but I mean, what I meant before is uh, when, to, when you talk about also about the times data set, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, both uh, the New York Times or the um, um, or this English uh, data set you mentioned, at the end of the day, these are newspaper articles which are more or less written by experts, right? It's not um, the average uh, guy on the on the website writes these uh, articles with this uh, uh, different uh, uh, namings of, of times and so on and so forth, slang, uh, all these kind of stuff uh, that makes things even more challenging in extracting proper time points, uh, the named entities involved, including all the typos and uh, these kind of things. As you mentioned correctly, um, these old um, data sets, they contain a lot of OCR errors, but when we now talk about uh, real life web data, well, we do not have OCR errors. We have now, <laughs> we have a lot, uh, lot of typos here, uh, hashtags, we have uh, acronyms, uh, we have, uh, well, uh, use language. Uh, I mean, uh, like young people, uh, they use different terminology, etc. Well, anyway, there are a lot of challenges, like you, like you say, uh, and I think uh, uh, these dynamics which we see in recent times, uh, well, is is impressive. So uh, maybe um, opening also the floor to the audience uh, uh, attending uh, this session. So what are your uh, opinions or what are, you, uh, what are your take homes from uh, 
the sessions, the workshops, any uh, ideas, uh, recommendations, something which you would like to state. So please uh, feel free to introduce yourself and uh, just, uh, well, feel free to uh, give a statement uh, what you think uh, could be of interest for you. So for the moment, I don't see any, well. Uh, Anything is fine. Perhaps you want to discuss your um, PhD research topic or your next research topic and get some, uh, share some insights. Uh, right. we, we are free to any feedback. So for the moment being, there is not much feedback here. So well then, Let's have a, a short outlook on what comes next. So um, uh, let's hope that the next year we will have another opportunity to, to go for a temp web, uh, maybe in such a hybrid mode uh, like you, uh, Adam, prefer. So, well, uh, I hope I will be there in, uh, in real life. So maybe you can then uh, log on to your machine or uh, maybe in even further in the future, we will have uh, well, uh, a 3D uh, virtual reality uh, event, well, which would be a hybrid plus plus. So maybe this is uh, uh, the future to come, but let's see. Uh, something else uh, to mention from your side, Adam, or? Um, no, I mean, I was just interested to, to know what is the next conference since you mentioned do you know perhaps any, or uh, is it still top secret? No, I think it's not top secret. Let me give me just one second. Uh, uh, I, I think it's going to be in Austin, Texas oh, okay. next year. Yeah. So uh, how come you know about it? Uh, I'm a volunteer. And so they had shared that. And I'm from Texas. So they specifically shared that with me. Okay, that's yeah. uh, good to know. Uh, let me just uh, check because there is an official website which actually tells uh, the status of this uh, information. That's so, very good. Uh, last time when I planned to attend Austin, there was a GCDA conference. There was mm -hmm. these these this epidemics. I think SARS at that time, where my oh, university sorry. banned me to go and I couldn't go. I will approach maybe again next year. Hopefully COVID or anything will not stop me. That's uh, right. Let's see. That sounds exciting. Yes, yeah. so the website says it is uh, Texas, USA. Uh, actually, the city is not uh, mentioned, but uh, Austin is probably uh, well one of the choices. Uh, and it is already mentioned it is May 1 to May 5. May 1 so to 5. Early. May 1 to 5, yes. Uh, so, well, if there's an, uh, no more comment from your side, well, then we can already conclude this uh, a little bit smaller uh, than desired uh, panel. So, unfortunately, two out of our panelists were not able to come here for personal reasons. But I thank all the audience uh, for attending and making uh, the workshop a success and well, sharing with us uh, all the opinions and uh, nice discussions uh, which we had throughout the day. And I'm looking forward well, then for hopefully a new edition next year then uh, in Austin, Texas. Maybe Cynthia, you will be the host then. So uh, that would be uh, pretty cool then to meet uh, in real life. Yes. in Austin, Texas. So why not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So any Thank concluding you, from the others? Okay. So if there are no more uh, comments, so then I would like to conclude uh, this panel. Thanks also to uh, Shivanji for, for um, uh, helping us here from the technical uh, point of view. Well, and then I'm looking forward to meeting you all the next year, either in real life or in hybrid uh, for another edition of TempWeb. Thanks, Thanks all Mark. of you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks Thank for you participating and have a nice day. Thank you.